I now call to order the regular session meeting of the Board of Commissions of the City of Tarpa Springs on Tuesday, October 8th, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Alahuzas? Here. Vice Mayor Sarah Penny? Here. Commissioner Sieber? Here. Commissioner Carr? Here. Commissioner Donovan? Here. Tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend Janet Howell from the uh, Old Saint Episcopal Church. If you please stand and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. Almighty God, send down upon those who hold office in the city of Tarpon Springs the spirit of wisdom, charity, and justice, that with steadfast purpose they may faithfully serve in their office to promote the well-being of all people. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our meeting tonight. I have two uh, announcements to make that uh, um, item number 12 of the agenda has been deferred to November 5th. And now we're going with the uh, public comments of the items that will not be discussed tonight. If you have any uh, comments, please come forward, state your name and your address for the record. You'll be given four minutes. Yeah, no, thank you. The first item on the agenda is a proclamation, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The City of Tarpa Springs, Florida proclamation would ask, October is the Breast Cancer Awareness Month, an annual campaign to increase awareness about the uh, disease. And whereas during this month, we reaffirm our commitment to support breast cancer research and to educate all citizens about the risk factors, detection, and treatment. And whereas we display pink ribbons and wear pink clothing to raise awareness, we also support those courageously fighting breast cancer and honor the lives lost to the disease, and whereas this October we recognize breast cancer survivors, those fighting the disease, their families and friends who are a tireless source of love and encouragement, and applaud the efforts of our medical professionals and researchers working to find cure for this deadly disease. Now, therefore, at Crystal Lahuzas, by the virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Tarpa Springs, Florida, to hereby proclaim the month of October 2019 as the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This proclamation will be mailed. Are there any commission comments? Are there any public comments on this item? Here, none. We go to item number two, Vice Mayor Chair Penn, and we'll read the proclamation for Community Flaming Month. Thank you, Mayor. The proclamation reads, whereas change is constant and affects all cities, towns, suburbs, county boroughs, townships, rural areas, and other places, and whereas the community planning month and plans can help manage this change in a way that provides better choices, choices for how people work and live, and whereas the full benefits of planning requires public officials and citizens who understand, support, and demand excellence, and whereas the celebration of National Community Planning Month gives us the opportunity to pub publicly recognize the participation and dedication of the members of planning who have contributed, to their, contributed their time and expertise to the improvement of the city of Tarpon Springs. And whereas the mayor and commissioners extend a heartfelt thanks for the continued commitment to public service from planning director Heather Erweller and staff. Now, therefore, I, Vice Mayor Townsend Terrapani, by the virtue of the authority vested in the mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2019 as Community Planning Month. Heather Erweller will accept the proclamation. If you would, please. Good evening, Heather Erler, Planning and Zoning Director. Um, I'd like to express my appreciation on behalf of the Planning and Zoning Department for recognizing Community Planning Month. A robust planning program is one of a community's best assets. A great planning program needs ample resources and support from the community to thrive. Over the last several years, the city's planning program has been transitioning, attempting to better integrate 
the various uh, other de city departments to ensure development is completed in a timely and fair way. This has added, this has added value you can see all around our community. At this point in time, the Planning and Zoning Department is going to be transitioning again as I prepare to leave. Um, it's with hope and gratitude that I say goodbye. Um, I'd like to uh, take a brief moment just to say thanks to a few folks. Uh, I just want to thank the Merchants Association who are in most representatives in the audience tonight and all the business owners and developers in the community. You made working with you a joy. I'd like to thank the community members serving on the various advisory boards. You do not always make the job easy, but each of you ca deeply cares for your community. To the department heads and the other city staff, I enjoyed working with all of you and wish you all the best. To the planning staff and Karen Lemons, you're all very special people. Thank you for sharing my vision and working so very hard. I'll miss you all. And finally, to city manager Mark Lacourse, who apparently is not here tonight. Um, we, di we did not always see eye to eye, but we could always put aside our differences and get the job done. You're a great leader, and I know that you and the city staff can do great things. It was an honor to be part of your team, and thank you, thank you for all the help and all your hard work. And that's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any commission comments? Are there any commission comments? Commissioner Siebert. Well, Heather, you just about made me cry. <laughs> uh, we appreciate how much you've done for the past, it's been five years for the city and, and how much we've moved forward with your leadership uh, in planning and zoning. And I appreciate everything you've done and I wish you lots of luck in your new venture. Uh, I wanna s keep hearing from you. But again, thank you for all you did for the city and, and what great changes you've made and, and moved us forward. So appreciate you very much. So. Are there any public comments on this item? <laughs> Hear none, thank you. We are now going to item number three. Commissioner Sibe will read the uh, proclamation on the National Arts and Humanities Month. proclamation reads, whereas October is designated National Arts and Humanities Month in the city of Tarpon Springs, and whereas the arts and humanities embody much of the accumulated wisdom, intellect, and imagination of humankind, and whereas the arts and humanities enhance and enrich the lives of every American, and whereas Tarpon Arts, a part of the Department of Cultural and Civic Services, plays an important role in the lives of families in our community. And whereas the city of Tarpon Springs celebrates with Tarpon Arts the value and positive impact of culture and the arts in the lives of our residents. Whereas the city of Tarpon Springs endorses the arts and culture in our city and appreciates the proficiency provided by our Tarpon Arts staff. Now therefore, I, Rhea Sieber, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> by the authority vested in uh, and Chris L., who is our mayor, um, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2019 as National Arts and Humanities Month. And um, where are you? Oh, it's Diane. <laughs> Diane will be accepting this. Good evening, Diane Wood, uh, Director of Cultural and Civic Services. Um, thank you so much for this honor. Um, all across the United States, we're celebrating the arts and humanities, and I thank you on behalf of um, our department as Tarpon Arts as well as the library because the arts <laughs> are so important in the lives of our young people as well as us. You know, in this day and age, you know, um, it's been so proven that you know, the arts contributes to reducing stress and helping concentration. There's just so many different things that it contributes to our well-being. So um, thank you for recognizing this. And um, my staff is awesome. And uh, I thank them for all their hard work. And thank you for your support. Appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any commission comments? Are there any public comments on this item? And now we go to item number four. <laughs> Commissioner Carter, if you please read the uh, proclamation on Fire Prevention Week. Thanks, Mayor. City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, proclamation. 
whereas the city of Tarpon Springs is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in, living in and visiting, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, <laughs> and homes are locations where people are at the greatest risk from fire, and whereas when the smoke alarm sounds, residents may have less than two minutes to escape to safety, and whereas residents who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And whereas residents should make sure <laughs> everyone in the home knows how to call 911 or the local emergency number. And whereas the city of Tarpon Springs first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And whereas 2019 Fire Prevention Week theme, not every hero wears a cape plan and practice your escape effectively serves to remind us that we need to take personal steps to increase our safety from fire now therefore i commissioner jacob carr by the virtue of the authority vested in the mayor of the city of tarpon springs florida do hereby proclaim the week of october 6th through 12th 2019 as fire prevention week and this is going to be received by deputy chief walsh and fire marshal marshal say a few words please yeah just uh, want to thank you for recognizing the uh, needs for fire prevention that we're teaching it in the schools uh, we get a lot of uh, young people getting quite educated as we show our units and our equipment and what we have and we appreciate the, uh, the help that you guys give us for this thank you thank you thank you for your service are there any commission comments are there any public comments on this item hearing none Thank you. We are now going to the uh, consent agenda. Item number five is special events. A is the Spring Duck Seafood Festival on November 8th through 10th, 2019. B is the Snow Place, December 6, 2019. C is the Boat Parade, December 6, 2019. The Art of Health, March 28, 2020. Six is the award file number 200015-N-CM sequel source purchase of Vencon original equipment manufacturer parts and services. Number server is review file number 1210122-NJJ maintenance of public restrooms at the uh, sponge exchange. And number eight is to reject all bits submitted for bid number 190132-B-JJ, Palm Avenue drainage improvements. Number nine is the wall fi uh, file number 200020-NJL, single source purchase of uh, EIM electric actuators, parts and services. Number 10 is the award file number 200014-C-JL, Utilize the Sarasota County contract 1917840100 for liquid carbon dioxide. Any of those, any item that you'd like to pull? Any uh, commission comments? Here are not. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion. Move to approve. And roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Terrapin? Yes. Mayor Alavizis? Yes, thank you. We are now going to the item number 11, which is the resolution 2019 30, the application 19 92, Caliber Collision Final Development Plan. City Attorney, if you please read the resolution. This is resolution 2019-30, resolution of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application 19-92, requesting final development plan approval for caliber collision, automobile collision repair center, providing for a certificate of concurrency, providing for conditions and providing for an effective date. That was a reading of resolution 2019-30 by title only. 
Thank you. Staff report. Good evening, Heather Earler, your zoning, planning and zoning director and staff to this application. Um, this application is following on um, an application that we finished um, a couple of weeks ago, which was an amendment to um, a plan development overlay district. And during that plan development, we essentially uh, set the zoning district to allow for Calvert Collision to come in with their final development plan, which essentially is their final site plan. Um, what you have before you is, in fact, their final site plan. Um, it's a feather, it's a rather <laughs> large document. Um, if you have any specific questions, we can answer them. But essentially, um, we tender the uh, staff report. Nothing has really changed since um, uh, the preliminary plan, and it's consistent with all of the uh, concurrency requirements of the Land Development Code. It's consistent with um, all of the technical specs and your comprehensive plan and uh, your technical review team has found it con technically consistent with um, all provisions of the land development code and um, and all of the other uh, city codes as a result um, staff is recommending approval of this application there's been no request for waivers uh, staff has a couple of conditions we'd like to add on to this approval and essentially the staff recommend uh, approval conditions are Developers responsible for retaining applicable permits from all of the agencies and meeting all the new requirements of the comprehensive zoning and land development code. Applicant shall complete the process for final plat, including all of the attendant easements and covenants. A building permit application and final construction plans shall be submitted within one year of the date of the final development, um, final plan development approval. And those are the conditions um, as uh, stated by staff with a recommendation of approval. And I can answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Heather, the last time we discussed this, the uh, neighbors that they live in the back, they had two concerns. One was drainage and the other was noise. Anything has changed on that? Absolutely not. The drainage is still um, ha handled by a master drainage system that was permitted under the original permit. Um, it's still, can the, perm the system is still working. All of the covenants will actually be required um, to be in place at the time when the final plat comes forward. They're working on the final plat as we speak. Um, so we don't anticipate any issues with that. And as for noise, the, those conditions have not changed. Most of the work that they have here is um, done inside the building. The only work that's done outside is some minor detailing of cars and the movement of cars around the site. So that's what is go occurs outside. There is no sandblasting outside or any type of real automotive work outside. So that has not changed. Thank you. Are there any commission comments? Vice Mayor Carapan. Thank you. Uh, Heather, on page three of your staff report, paragraph F, or subparagraph F, the transportation uh, says that the project will generate 530 trips per day. Is that is that right, or is that a typo? That's the yeah, that's the total trips per day, and the peak hour um, is 53 trips. So they're saying that there's going to be 530 trips. Now, what's a trip there and back, or what? Well, a trip is uh, again, it's not a trip as you plan a trip as an individual going out. It's it's a it's an algorithm that's used um, to account for the number of vehicles that will actually be entering and leaving a site uh -huh. um, on any given day. So some of those trips are actually shared trips that you might, not that you would be picking up your car always, but you may be picking up your car and then going to other places. So there's a shared value <coughs> that's mm -hmm. added. Those are, um, those are actually determined based on their standard model. Um, again, this facility may be different. It again it depends on the traffic flow that actually comes to this facility for repair. They're giving you their basic their basic information based on this size facility um, that they utilize on their standard floor. They can maybe able to actually speak to that more that question very spe more specifically too because again they have more criteria they have more understanding of how their actual operation operates. But we aren't an anticipating any issue with those additional trips. I, I, yeah, I'll hear from the applicant on that just out of curiosity. Any other questions that I can answer? Any other questions? Yeah, one. Uh, <coughs> I noticed the landscape plan. There's a lot of trees. Uh, they're they're going above and beyond what's required, right, by code, to help correct cover this building up from the neighborhood. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to reiterate that. And also, I noticed the stop signs and the street signs look like they are using the powder coated decorative sign too. So thank you for working with the applicant on that one. Or maybe Agreed. they already had. Th those have been included. Okay. Are there any public comments on the site? The applicant can answer your question if you'd like. He's they're here. They know about your Guys, presentation. I want to hear from the okay. Yeah, if we could get the applicant here, please. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, my name is Scott Standard. I'm with Commercial Site Solutions. We are the site civil engineers, and we are also the agents for the applicant, which is Cross Development, which is building the caliber collision. Uh, I want to thank Heather for working with us on this and getting us to this point. Specifically to your question about traffic, the uh, the 508 is actually not the uh, that is not for the caliber. That was the total that was previously approved for the master plan when this was all retail. Uh, the caliber actually is a good bit lower than that. It's 53 on the peak. Um, when you throw in the retail, you have a northern tool that's out there, and uh, then the already approved uh, already approved retail, which would be the remainder of those parcels. That's where you get the total that you're talking about. So the 530 is from the original master plan, not just for for your use in yes, itself. Yes, sir. And, that and makes just a lot more to kind of elaborate too to that end, and she she made a really good point about this. I'll bore you with some traffic engineering, but the the way that's done is what's called ITE, it's International Trip Generation Data that we use based on the anticipated use and based on the size. And then you, you take those numbers and you come up with some trip generation numbers based on studies of other uses of that type, so like restaurants or retail or in this case automotive repair. The ITEE classification for automotive repair is specific to automotive repair as if you were actually going to get your car repaired. Much different than my car got hit and it has to come in and get, you know, buffed out and painted or whatever the case may be. There just doesn't happen to be an ITE classification for automobile, automobile repair that only deals with paint and body. So we have to use the automobile repair classification that they have. Uh, and th the reason I bring that up is the actual numbers are far lower than that. Right. As you would imagine, not very many people, hopefully, sure. are ever going in and out of an automotive repair for paint and body. But that's the only classification we have to go by. I appreciate your explanation. I think it uh, makes a lot more sense regarding the master plan of Northern Tool, right. your use, and then the undeveloped site next to it for 530 trips total makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any public comments of this item? See yeah, none. Chair will entertain a motion. Motion approved. Second. And roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Seabury? Yes. Vice Mayor Chair Payne? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, item number 12 has been deferred. Uh, we go to item number 13, which is appointments for uh, the Public Art Committee. <coughs> uh, I'm sure you'll uh, receive the memo that uh, Mrs. Indian, uh, Indianos has withdrawn her application. Okay. Well, we have, currently we have four vacancies on this public art committee. Two members have requested to be reappointed. Uh, number one is to reappoint uh, Julie Eichmeyer Eich for another three years term. This term will expire October 31st, 2022. And the other reappointment is for Patricia Gregory for the alternate number one for another three year term. This term will expire October 31st, 2022. I will support the, uh, both of those reappointments. Uh, it is good to have uh, people that already uh, know what is happening with the, uh, uh, with the art committee and the projects that they're working with. So. Uh, suggest that we reappoint those two individuals. I'll support that, Mayor. Okay. I'm good with that, Chair. Oh, you're good? Yes. Thank you. Support it. Commissioner Carr? Yeah, my support. Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> the next is appointment uh, to fill the unexpired term of uh, Chair Orr, this term will expire October 31st, 2020. We need to uh, select one of the uh, one of the applicants, Commissioner Carr. You want to start with you? Okay. Uh, would uh, recommend Theodore. I'm not sure how to say his last name. Any you? Iwano. The student. Yeah. Now, we need to make sure that the person understand that uh, this term will expire October 31st, 2020. So it's con right. 
Ioana is a student from St. Petersburg College. Correct. That's a year from me. That's a year from me. Mm -hmm. Which I think is good because we're at, we don't know how long he's going to be a student at the same right. college. Right. So we worked out good. I'm, I'm down on that. <coughs> I will that as well. Okay. I got, I'm with Theodore. You okay? Mm -hmm. Fine. Yeah, I got Theodore. Okay. So <coughs> that would be uh, Mr. Ioana. Next is to appoint uh, two members for uh, this term will expire October 31st, 2022. This appointment becomes effective November 1st, 2019. And we need to have two, uh, two people there. I would like to see uh, Lucienne Robinson to serve on the one of the two. I support Ms. Robinson as well. Okay. So do I. I support that. Thank you. Vice Mayor, you want to? I'll select, uh, I know William Neal's personally. Uh, he's new, newer to the area, been coming here for four or five years and has recently moved him and his wife here from out of town. Mm -hmm. And they're taking an active role and I think he'd be good on the board. Great. Thank you. I support that. Commissioner Clark? Uh, I had a question, I think. He was, uh, if I can correct. He had interest in the Planning and Zoning Board. I wasn't sure if there's anything coming up from the Planning and Zoning Board at all that you're aware of. That there were, okay. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll support it. Yeah, I was, also, I was also curious because uh, Public Art Committee was third on his choices of uh, what he wants, where he wants to serve. So I had either Deborah Hennessy or Sandra Holliber um, in that position. So, but I'll go with whatever the board decides. Okay. Again, which one did you recommend? Either Deborah Hennessy or Sandra Holliber. Holliber. Okay. Commission Donovan? I'm good with Mr. Meals. Mr. Mr. Meals. I'm okay. all right with that. So we have consensus on that one. Mm -hmm. And the last one is to appoint an alternate number two. This term will expire October 31st. 2022. 2022. Mr. Peter. Well. I have Lynn Kopak there, but um, I still would like to see Deborah Hennessy or Sandra Holliber uh, on there. So it's whatever you all decide. I but have I Sandra Holliber for one. I'll go with them. Okay. Also. Okay. I'll go. Commission Donovan. Uh, I had Robert Stackhouse or Michaela Oberlander. But again, I mean, I think they're all great applicants. I'm just throwing those names out there. Okay. Commission Clark. Um, I had uh, I had two, which was Sandra Holliber and Robert Stackhouse were the, the two I had pinned down for this one. Okay. So? Um, I think in this situation, Robert Stackhouse. Okay, thank you. Uh, we need a motion for these appointments. Well, we have we don't have consensus on this one. We have two for oh. Holliber and Stack house. So we don't have a consensus. Okay. Also, one Holber as well. Holber it is. Okay. So we have a consensus on that. So now we need an, uh, a motion for appointment. I'll make a motion to uh, reappoint Julie Eckmeyer. So another three-year term uh, that expires on October 31st, 2020. Reappoint Patricia Gregory. 2022. 2022. Uh, Reappoint Patricia Gregory, alternate number one, to another three-year term that will expire October 31st, 2022. Um, appoint Theodore Enu um, to fulfill the unexpired term of Sherry Orr that will expire October 31st, 2020. To appoint William Meals 
and Lucianne Robinson uh, to terms that will expire October 31st, 2022, and appoint Sandra Holliber as alternate number two uh, that will expire October 31st, 2022. So we have a motion. I need a second. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Donegan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Seaver? Yes. Vice Mayor Kenny? Yes. Yes, thank you. Well, that concludes the agenda tonight. And we're going to go to staff comments. Sergeant, do you have any comments? Yes, sir. City Attorney? No comments, thank you. Acting City Manager? No comments, thank you. Thank you. Chair Clark? Nothing. Vice Mayor Terrapani? Uh, no comments, Mayor. Commission Seaver? Uh, I just want to tell everybody about uh, Salsa on the Docks this Saturday. It's usually a, a huge event, and i um, looking forward to it. We bring people from all over in buses. Well, we don't. The organizers do. The Merchants Association who are um, in charge of that. So I'm looking forward to that, and uh, just want to wish Heather good luck again. Sad to see her go. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Carr? No comments. Commissioner Donovan? No comment, Mayor. Thank you. I have several announcements to make. Friday, October 11th, we have the uh, free produce giveaway sponsored by uh, the Farm Share and Pinellas County Board of uh, Commissioners uh, at the St. Uh, Timothy's Lutheran Church. That begins at 9 a.m. Uh, they're also looking for volunteers. If anyone is interested to help out, please go there and I'm going to be helping out as well. Uh, Saturday, October 12, we have the uh, Sunset Beach Cleanup sponsored by the City of Tarver Springs and Key Pinellas Beautiful. That begins at 10 a.m. to noon. Com Commissioner Sieber mentioned about the salsa. That's going to be a great event. Uh, Friday, October 18th, we have the um, Healthy Hub Transportation for Seniors Workshop that will be presented by the uh, PSTA at 2 p.m at the library. People will learn about senior transportation, free transportation for seniors uh, 65 years or older. And I think it's going to be very beneficial for people to go, not only for the seniors, but also people that have uh, uh, family members to go there to learn about this great service. Uh, also, I like to welcome the new business to town, Crisula Walking Tours. She started a new business, uh, that's Ms. Salikas. And um, looking, um, I want to wish you to have a great, uh, great success. Well, that concludes the regular session meeting. It's adjourned at 7.03 p.m. All right, I'll see you guys later. Can yeah, I great. add something to that? Good night. Huh? I, I just wanted to add something uh, to an, uh, another new business that opened Friday nights. Uh, we had the ribbon cutting at the okay. new Creole restaurant. Uh, yeah. Looks like it's going to be a, a great addition to Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Don't go away because we still have another meeting, guys. <laughs> Okay, I now call to order the work session of the Board of Commissions of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, October 8th at 7.04 p.m. And roll call, please. Who's this? Here. Vice Mayor Tio Kenny. Here. Commissioner Seaver. Here. Commissioner Carr. Here. Commissioner Donovan. Here. I'd like to uh, remind to everyone that the work sessions are primary design for information gathering and guidance. No formal commission decision approving or disapproving an item may be made. Only staff members will be included in the work session discussion unless prior arrangements have been made through the city manager, city clerk, or city attorney. 
The only item on the agenda is a charter review recommendations. And um, if we uh, remember on the uh, September 24th at the last regular meeting, uh, Mr. Colianos, the chairman of the Charter Review Commission, presented to us the uh, proposed amendments of the Charter Review Commission. And we decided to have this work session tonight to uh, discuss these uh, recommendations. I requested that the chairman, Mr. Colianos, to be present tonight to answer any uh, questions that we might have. He's a front and center already. Thank you for being here, Mr. Colianos. And I'd like to, uh, excuse me, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Trax to review the uh, the process. We'll proceed and explain session 32, section 32 amendment of the charter. Okay, so it's my suggestion that we go through each one of these sections, uh, section by section, ask questions if you have questions about the particular uh, section, um, and then discussion on each particular section, any specific changes that you would request. Um, I would also remind you at the end of the day, whatever suggestions that are, it's gonna go back to the committee for consideration. Uh, those will be separate and apart for any additional recommendations for changes to the charter that the commission wants to make. Um, and um, all of that is set forth in section 32 of your charter. And I'd just like to take a minute or so just to read it so that everybody is on the same page. So it's titled amendments and it reads as follows. This charter may be amended as provided in section 166.031 Florida statutes. The Board of Commissioners shall appoint a charter revision commission at least every five years to review the provisions thereof and recommend any changes to this, in this charter. Such commission shall be composed of seven members and the affirmative vote of four such members shall be required to propose any change to this charter. Such commission shall receive comment from the Board of Commissioners, charter officials and the public and then shall transmit the proposed charter amendments in ordinance form to the Board of Commissioners for further comment. That's where we are today. The Board of Commissioners shall, within 30 days, return the proposed amendments to the Charter Revision Commission with its recommended proposals. Those are obviously changes to what the uh, commission is suggesting. After uh, review thereof, the Charter Revision Commission shall make its own final report to the Board of Commissioners in ordinance form, which shall be adopted verbatim by the Board of Commissioners. The Board of Commissioners shall within 120 days of such final report hold an election on the recommended proposals. In the same election, the Board of Commissioners may sponsor its own proposals and also uh, including public initiative proposals. The referendum summary shall advise the public as to whether the proposal is sponsored by the Charter Revision Commission by the Board of Commissioners or by public initiative. In the event of any conflict among the proposals, that proposal receiving the greatest number of affirmative votes shall prevail to the extent of such conflict. Upon request of the city attorney, a charter revision commission shall render an advisory opinion to the city attorney concerning an interpretation of this charter. That was a reading of section 32 in its entirety. It's been in existence in some form since 1983. The last amendments to this particular section was in the year 2000. So with that, Mayor, I hand it back over to you. If we Thank wanted you. to start with section three of the ordinance. Just for clarification, we have 30 days to return the proposed amendments to the Charter <coughs> Revision Committee. That begins September 24th? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, the first, uh, <coughs> section is section three, age limitation of powers. Um, <coughs> Mr. Colinas, I don't have uh, a question to ask you, but uh, I like that. Uh, I'm glad that you guys are uh, suggesting that because that's one of my recommendations. I believe it's, uh, I think it makes sense to increase the, uh, the spending for purchasing the real estate from 250,000 to 500. Um, which one are you on there? This is uh, section number three. That will be on no page number six. Limitation of powers. Got it. It's number one on ours, I think. The uh, you start in page number five and it goes to page number six. Are there any commission <coughs> questions to you, Mr. Colianos? Uh, regarding that item? Oh, that particular Specific one. That particular that particular one. one. Yeah, I can, uh, I 
understand the intent and I think it's uh, well designed to try and give the board and ultimately staff more purchasing power so to speak mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I think you know although we have what appears to be a big you know 62 million dollar budget I think that to to be able to spend a half million dollars how we basically choose on the purchase or the sale of property is is too much um, I could see going up a little bit um, especially as it relates to like our particular purchasing power and right I, I get it like for example the cemetery was a great the cemetery expansion was a great use of this power right <coughs> so we were able to buy a piece of property that was you know could have been sold for probably a lot more money to anybody on the open market the seller wanted to make a deal with the city so they kept it under the $250,000 yeah the 250,000 dollar price point so I, I get the idea of trying to have more purchasing power in the event that that parcel was sold at market value for 350 and it was something that we really needed um, but I'm not I don't support the half a million I think that that's still too much uh, and I think that the residents ultimately will also believe that when it comes time to vote on it um, I could com you know I would certainly be willing to compromise on a, on a higher amount but I think that half a million is is too much Do you ask a question Cool, what, what amount would you propose? Uh, 300, 350. 350. You know, I mean, something, you know, that gives us a little, yeah. you know, services the intent of what the commission recommended to us, which was more purchasing power, which I support. But I think that a half a million just, you know, as right. we see fit is just too much. Right. Not that, they would, that, they, that we would make a bad decision, but, you know, it's in here for a reason. So. Well, I, I understand. Uh, uh, you, the logic behind that, but the thing is, when two hundred fifty thousand dollars was uh, actually uh, placed into the uh, to the charter was many years ago. Uh, you in real estate, and you know that if we're going to buy a, a piece of property, let's say to, to build a pool or something else, a recreation, two hundred fifty thousand dollars is not going to be enough. So we have to wait till uh, it goes to referendum. But then, the, you know, that deal might not be available. Understood. That's the reason why. Oh, I, I get it. I mean, it makes, like I said, it's yeah. sensible. I appreciate it, but I just am not comfortable with the half a million. No. Okay. So I you would recommend 300 to uh, I'm good with 350. I mean, $100,000 increase in, in our purchasing power, I think, is quite a bit. Okay. I think 350 still goes a long way as it relates to the types of property that would be uh, needed out of necessity. Okay. Commissioner Sieber, what do you recommend? Uh, I feel the same way. I think that our citizens need to make that decision if it's going to be more than that, and it should go to referendum. Okay. Um, Commissioner Carr? In this situation, I'm, I'm a little bit indifferent about it. Uh, I understand we should have the ability. We buy million-dollar fire trucks. We buy million-dollar equipment for the water plant. Um, the one thing I do think it's beneficial to the commission and to the city is it, it gives the city negotiation power. Uh, the two examples would be the, the property next to the Jimmy's out in Gulf Road and then also the cemetery, uh, the new cemetery plot that Vice Mayor brought up is that they both fell below the $250 or $250,000 mark. Um, it gives the city manager negotiation power to say, look, I can't go any higher than this. If you want to sell this, I can't go any higher. I'm sorry. Um, unless you want to go to a public um, referendum and then that's going to take quite some time to do it. So. I do understand from a negotiation standpoint, it puts a city in a negotiating power. I think if it's less, um, and at the end of the day, I'm, I'm never one to stop something from going to a vote to the residents. So I'm not against that. If it's if we want if it's at the board's will and we have a consensus of it, I would support lowering it um, to 350 uh, from the 500. So I, that I would be okay with that. Commission Donovan. Yeah, I'm comfortable with the 500,000 just because, I mean, it has the exclusion of parks, recreation, and waterfront property. And, you know, I think we were elected to make those kind of kinds of decisions. Um, but again, if, if we want to um, put it up to referendum, I'd, I'd be okay with that too. But for now, I, I support the $500,000 increase. Thank you. Well, I also think the uh, $500,000 to give us the uh, the leverage to buy any uh, piece of property that's available and don't want to lose any uh, opportunity that will be out there. So I will support 500. 
and seems like the uh, consensus is for three fifths. Right, Tom? Yeah. Okay. Acting city manager, you have any comments on that? No comments on this item. Thank you. Mr. Colina. Just for the record, I would share with you that this was one of the issues that we handled that it was relatively simple for us because everybody who came to speak basically uh, wanted to increase the $500,000, didn't seem to upset anybody. The purchase of the properties that happened, we even had an attorney there who told us that the reason we got the property for the due portions for the cemetery is because the owner, in fact, is a Tarponite, and he did it for the city. Otherwise, we would have never bought it for that money. I, you guys have a tough decision, and, and it, to, to me it's not hard. This is uh, 2019, and we need to step up and go forward with just like we're dumping everything on you on the rest of these things. So the f two f the 500000 was not an issue with anybody who came and spoke with us. Well, any, that's uh, your pleasure. Any other comments? Any other commissioners? Any other comments on this? Of course, Ms. Gibbons. Uh, yes, I, I know that. And initially, I really thought 500000 was okay. But I feel like we're, the city should not be in the real estate business. And we really need to respect our residents um, and, and bring things to referendum to help them decide rather than us decide on, on big projects like, like this. Like the hotel didn't go to referendum. Um, I, and, and there are a lot of people who were upset about it. So I just still feel that <coughs> our citizens, our residents should have the option to uh, to go to referendum if, if it's over 350. Well, we have a consensus, so we move on. The next one is section number eight, and that's on page six and seven. Board of Commissioners, composition, duties, responsibilities, and powers. Questions to Mr. Colianos. I've got one, Mayor. Go ahead. Uh, when I look at uh, Section 3, which is Section 8, and then I look at Letter J, it reads as the following, to preserve and maintain city-owned park, recreation, and waterfront property, no park, recreation, or waterfront property. And it reads on, et cetera. Um, but the part that I, that I have questions about is um, the Board of Commissioners by ordinance may change the use, um, including the elimination of green space, any city park um, or portion thereof, only after an affirmative vote of four members of the Board of Commissioners after three public meetings. Uh, so when I read this, I, I think of elimination of green space. So. Um, if I want to get technical in the situation, if I put a sidewalk in or a trail in, we're eliminating green space. Um, I'm not really sure what the intent of this portion is. I think it's uh, rather restricting to put three public meetings in when we don't have any other requirements of three public meetings that I'm aware of for anything else. Um, <coughs> I just don't, I want a little more information if um, Chair Koulianis, if you could help me out with that to help me understand this a little bit more. Basically, the long and short of it is is that we're running out of green space we're, we're running out of those areas and, and the the property and the money to purchase additional and we just thought basically that the public should have an opportunity to come before you and make their case three times it's not a big deal if you're gonna if you're gonna let's just say hypothetically you've decided Rotary Park would be better for holding storm water and you want to get rid of that you're not gonna get rid of it under this unless you have three public meetings unless it, you can hear then what the public has to say about eliminating anything like that this is only for the protection of uh, the property 
So if, I know that was an extreme example, but if I go back to my example of putting a sidewalk in, or if we want to build a pickleball court, um, if the city feels the need to, um, or something along those lines, it would go through the same aspect. If we want to build a, a bathroom, or if we wanted to build a, a trail out at Highland Park, am I, I? I might be reading too far into this. I think this. I think it's a little very. I think it's actually very restrictive on how it's done. I think there's a middle ground to still preserve parks. The last thing I want to see is a park paved over and put a parking lot on, right? Well, and, and I totally agree with you. That's the last thing I want to see, but if we think back about Craig Park and what some of the options are being right now to provide boat storage, trailer storage, okay. we're talking about doing away with green space. So this is specifically for Craig Park then about the boat storage. And I think that's an issue with this because it's a specific item that we're addressing in that situation myself. So I couldn't support the letter J um, with the portion that I read, including elimination of green space and the three public meetings. I, I understand that it comes from a good position from the board, and I think they want to preserve the land and the area, and that's I completely support that. But to restrict the board's hands to say you have to have three public meetings, you have to have four public or four bo um, votes by the board. It's just there's too much into the details into this and. If we want to talk about eliminating a park altogether, like you mentioned Rotary Field as an example, I think you're, that's, a better, that's a better example, saying if you want to eliminate a park altogether, eliminate the green space, and create a, um, a water storage tank or parking lot or whatever it may be, I think that would be an alternative. Uh, because at the end of the day, though, we have to evaluate when you see growth and a demand in a park, and you need more parking in the park, you have to be able to evaluate both of those at the same time to say, we've got a beautiful space, but there's no parking. So what do you do at that point? It's well a passive I, park that you I drive totally, by. I totally agree with you. You have to you review it and give everything their due diligence before you make a determination. And that's basically what the three meetings are for. As you can see, you're having a work session and you have regular sessions and the audience is not here. Okay, most people, when we, hear about it is after the fact Craig Park you're gonna take out maybe take out the, the uh, shuffleboard courts the buildings already been removed nobody remembers when that came down where do we get that green space back shouldn't the public have every ample opportunity to come up here and say no please don't do it the buildings gone there I just found out the other day the building was gone, all right? I found out some time ago that the considering parking for trailers because that's where our only boat ramp is. And I think that's parking for trailers is a necessity, but which is more important? The kids gotta have a place to go. That's a meeting place, it's a van shell. There are celebrations there, the Easter egg hunt. So we're going to take a piece of that away just to park boat trailers? No. I, I'm, I'm an avid boater, okay? Unfortunately, I have three boats in my yard. None of them belong to me. They belong to my family. But I've always had boats. And I'll tell you what, it was my responsibility where that trailer went when I put the boat in the water, okay? You have an ordinance, I believe, or a resolution saying you didn't want the people to park trailers after they launch their boats in the fruit bowl area. Go there any Saturday and Sunday, they're loaded in there. It, it's up to you guys. We Everything we're going to talk about tonight, we put back on you. You're the Board of Commissioners. You have to make those decisions. If you make them, you have to enforce them. So that's what this committee was about. We gave it all back. Thank you for sharing that. I <laughs> uh, appreciate the background. D just to the rest of the board, I do have a concern with this portion of it. The rest of it I'm, I'm fine with. So you're saying from <coughs> after referendum down? Um, you're okay with the sale donated uh, of a piece of city-owned property with majority vote? in a citywide referendum period, correct? And then going on, the Board of Commissioners by ordinance is what you object to? 
Uh, two meetings, I suppose, would be the part that I would go to. Because the last sentence I'm fine with. Okay. Uh, you, you have a problem with the three meetings. How many meetings are you going to have? Is it the three meetings, or is it the it's intent of the language? It's the intent of the language of elimination of green space. Um, and like I said, if the city wanted to put a sidewalk in, you're eliminating green space. Right. So I to stay by the charter, we've got to be careful. I hear what you're saying. I mean, to me, you know, on one hand, we're saying, okay, we can spend half a million dollars, right? But on the other hand, we're saying <coughs> you can't put in a sidewalk or you can't, you know, fulfill a, a need or a demand within the park the way that without having the three mit uh, three meetings and the four affirmative votes, which I don't want to lose any green space either, but I do understand that if, you know, as the city is growing and we're trying to fulfill new demands as it relates to sports or, you know, recreation or whatever, to tie our hands to this degree, you know, I think is a little bit excessive. I mean, if we want to, you know, try and come up with a better sentence that speaks to modifications, alterations, or improvements of said park, you know, and the limitations that we can go, then I think that that, you know, I think that that this sentence could be reworked to a degree. I mean, I don't necessarily have an issue with the four members and the three public hearings, but I don't want to have to do that to put in a, a sidewalk that we think needs to go in. You know what I mean? I don't want to do that to to make some minor, in the grand scheme of things, minor improvement to a park, you know, when the Board of Commissioners were elected by the community at large to make decisions like that. But I understand both sides. I know where the Charter Review Committee is coming from, and I think that the majority of, of paragraph J is addressed, you know, by the need to go out to referendum in terms of a sale or, you sure. know, things like that. But I don't think that, you know, we should have our hands tied to this degree for some type of modification or improvement to a city park, you know. I mean, in theory, you could say, okay, we want to put a new playground there. I mean, I don't know. Does that take away green space? Right? I mean, I agree with that. Yeah. Mr. Siebel. I'm not sure if we're replacing a playground in an existing section, if that's taking away from green space, because there's already a playground there. Um, I'm, I'm pretty opposed to eliminating green space. So um, I, I know we were elected to make these decisions, but I also feel that we need to respect our... Um, our residents and, and hear what they have to say. And if they're opposed to uh, eliminating green, green space, we should give them that opportunity. Um, maybe three meetings is too much. We could change it to two or change the language here, but I do feel that um, this should be pretty restrictive. Uh, yeah. I, I just, I don't like taking away green space. Well, Commissioner Sieber, if I understand what uh, the Vice Mayor and Commissioner Carr said, they're not taking any green space away. They just said be able to build and do some modifications to the green space that they have. So uh, we should be eliminating like the green space. It says it right in here. Elimination of green space uh, of any city park or portion thereof. Um, so anyway, I, you know, we could reduce it or change the language or whatever, but I do feel like it's important to hear from, to have some, some meetings with our residents before we do something. I wouldn't like even that. propose taking that language out. I would just build on this sentence to, to the degree that it gives us a little bit of flexibility for you know, minor improvements. I mean, do you, pr do you put a percentage in terms of a calculation of the green space change? I mean, do you, you know, add some language that says that we can, you know, within our limitations and powers, we can, I don't know, I'd lean on the city attorney for some, you know, yeah, to help here, but I'm, I mean. I'm gonna ask. The uh, city attorney, if he has any uh, recomm recommended language for what we plan to do. How much space? <laughs> well, I definitely think that um, the use of a percentage, and maybe it be a or square footage, percentage of the square footage of a park, for example, you know, 10% of the square footage of a, a park, um, you know, would be considered a minor change or 15%. You guys pick the number, uh, but we could add, suggest a sentence to be added. Now, keep in mind, all these suggestions that you're making. This commission can say, and the Charter Review Commission can say, we've heard you, we don't agree, we're gonna keep it exactly the way that, um, that we suggested it, so. That's um, just recommendations we're doing. Yeah, we're just doing recommendations at yeah. this point. So, um, if there's a recommendation for me to prepare some language on a percentage basis or square footage basis of a park, I could, I could do that. Yeah. I think Commissioner Robin had some. Go ahead. 
Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody wants to eliminate green space or sell any of our parks. Um, but to not be able to put in a sidewalk or something or a uh, <laughs> playground just to maximize the enjoyment of the park, I think might be a little restrictive. When I first read this, I interpreted it just as selling places like Rotary Field or Riverside Field or something like that. And if that were to occur, um, to eliminate those or to sell those, then absolutely, I think we need to maximize public input. I'd be fine with three meetings. I'd even want something to be mailed. Um, but I think really the answer here is just cleaning up the language of this because I really, really don't want our parks to be touched. But at the same time, uh, as our city grows, if we need to be able to put in a sidewalk or a different type of path, I'd like to be able to do that, um, you know, without three public meetings and months of hoops to jump through. So I think we can take a look at this language and maybe hammer it out a little bit better. Um, maybe include a sentence um, exempting it if it's if it's a specific improvement of the park if it's like an infrastructural improvement of the park um, I don't want to get too bogged down thinking about um, the Craig Park boat ramp issue and stuff like that because that's maybe this was ma in there to address that but the language in here is the language in here for all of our parks so I think we can't get too bogged down with one specific issue we need to make sure that it applies to them all so I think we should take a look at that language and maybe come back to it Mr. Trask, can we uh, say that with excluding the sidewalk and the playground, something like that? I, I don't think that you would want to get into the specific name, what we can do with it, because there's going to be a situation where there's something that we didn't include. Okay. So how about, and I'm suggesting adding right after the words elimination of green space of more than blank percentage of the square footage of the um, green space and you tell me what percentage it be <coughs> so <laughs> if we have a 10,000 square foot park and 10% of that would be 9,000 square feet That's a lot. <laughs> I mean I think that it you know we should brainstorm that calculation a little bit more but we have other aspects of our code that utilize the same type of percentage as it relates to like staff level you know of approval like the hospital is a good example of that so I mean it's certainly a mechanism that we already use within our code it's just a matter of finding the balance of, you know, wh what our intentions are. I do feel the percentage has to be much lower than 10 percent, though. It's yeah, I, I a agree. Huge, I agree. Yeah, a it needs to be less than 10 percent. Yeah, I agree for sure. I mean, especially when you start talking about a lot of acres. But it's difficult to just say a percentage. I mean, off the top of my head, I would say maybe 5 percent would be an avenue to start at. But to really get it, evaluate what our total park space is in a park to get a better picture what that looks like. Maybe it's 2%. I, I don't really know what it is, but mm -hmm. um, I'm not against the public meetings. I, I think three is too many, but that's fine if the rest of the board wants to have a three. Um, but I think it would be a good idea to, to clean this up a little bit more. Well, we I could agree. reduce it to two. I'd be fine with that as long as we have public meetings. If we keep it the way it is with three meetings, it's just going to take another uh, two weeks. To do what if we in, what if we included one of the three to be part of the planning and zoning board process? In w in which case, that's true. It's just like it is now. If you wanted to bring something forward that changed, yeah, you know, some land use or something, it'd have to go to PNZ, then it goes to two meetings to the DOT. Yeah, that's that's yeah. three meetings already. Right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's probably better that way than dealing with percentage. Leave it as a percentage. No, or leave no. Instead of dealing with percentage, just, just go back. Just yeah. include one of the meetings to be heard by the planning and zoning board. Planning and zoning. I'm good with that. Yeah. Well, the way it reads right now, it doesn't require it to be three public hearings before you. It's just three public hearings. That can be. So if you had a town hall meeting, that's a, you know, it could be considered, you know, one of those public meetings. Um, it, the way it reads right now, it just says that there has to be three meetings. It doesn't mean that they all have to be before you. What if we include one of which goes before the planning and zoning board? I mean, it's, it's the planning and zoning board to begin with. You know, it's logical that it would that a, an alteration like that would would go before them. So th you know we could we can add some additional language to uh, to address that, but it doesn't get to the meat of the argument that the elimination of green space. Yeah, the elimination of green space. So um, I mean, look at it like this way for a minute. You could rezone a property, and or uh, or make application to rezone a property, which could be a lot bigger deal than this. And do it in three meetings. So I mean, 
when you look at it like that, you know, if you if you're trying to add some parking square footage or whatever the case may be, you wouldn't want it to be more of a strenuous process than it would if you wanted to rezone a piece of property from its least intensive use to its most intensive use. Mm -hmm. Right? I think I'm good with it the way it is. It's a very good discussion, but we keep it the way it is. I mean, if you look at it like that. Commissioner Carr? Yeah, I still, the elimination of green space, I still have some issues with that. Um, because again, it goes back to the, I'm good with the leaving of the way it is with three public meetings um, based on the discussions we just had, but the elimination of green space, I think is still very restrictive. So I think having some type of percentage in there is key to the, to the discussion. Um, again, sidewalks, and if, we, if the board so feels the best way to go to have a new sidewalk or water fountain or playground is to have a public meeting about it, I'm okay with that as well. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's the best use of city staff time and our time as commissioners and the public's time is to have a discussion about a sidewalk that's going into the park space. I agree with that too. Yeah, but on the other hand, I think uh, you give the opportunity to the, the citizens to come here three times to tell us what they want. Yeah, uh, but if we're just talking about a sidewalk that's you know, you know 20 feet long. Well, it can be not only sidewalks, but it can be other other things as well. We bring the sidewalk as an example, but it can be other things yeah. that you put as a user space. Yeah, it could be building a 2,000 square foot shelter, right? Could or it could too. be a trail. Yeah. It could be a monument. It could be a if you're doing a percentage, you tie yourself down to. Uh, uh, twenty, uh, you know, like ten percent is a big part of the uh, of the building. Couldn't support part. that. Yeah, yeah. So well, let's leave it. The I'll leave it. Let's leave it the way it is. I think, and I agree with uh, Vice Mayor Tara Pandy that one of those meetings can be uh, the Planning and Zoning Board. So that's public hearing as well. Mm -hmm. Unless you want to add some language to that or not. The only the only thing that's more li more limiting to you than what you're doing right now is it requires four commissioners to vote on it if you really get it yeah. down to its finest thing you're going to hear these things anyhow you're going to make the decision anyhow it's just a question of how many public hearings and if you have one outside of the commission you have your normal two public hearings here you're still making the same decision the only limiting factor here is four members mm -hmm. you're, you would make these decisions anyhow here yeah after hearing public input Is there anything else that we have for commissioners? Super majority? Uh, that meeting for the night, item 12 tonight was just the majority, I think. It's just, it's the sale of real estate, yeah. uh, real property. Now, explain that to us again. The um, super majority was the four members of the Board of Commissioners. That means it has to pass on all three public hearings? Or no, not? there just has to be three public hearings. There's only going to be one vote. The so vote is going to be in, in the last one? Yeah. So okay. you're, you're in your third meeting. You're going to take all that input on the first meeting and then the second meeting, or if you're going to have your planning and zoning board take the first meeting, you're going to hear it twice, and you're only going to make your vote on the last meeting after the three have occurred. Okay. So you wouldn't vote at every single meeting. Just do it at one time. So how does everybody feel about a super majority vote for this item? Well, if it's so critical to have uh, green space to us, to, to the people of Tarpon, I think it's good to have four members to have a super majority. That's my opinion. And you? Vice Mayor? I don't know, Mayor. I mean, you keep on going back to how much it's going to, in theory, potentially limit us depending on the type of project we're talking about. Well, again, what I heard just a few minutes ago is how important it is not to eliminate green space. I'm, I'm with you there. You know, so mm -hmm. by doing it as a supermajority, now we make sure that that's what we really want based on the information we give you the people. A little bit of emphasis on it. Yeah. The four, the supermajority makes an emphasis that it's yeah. got to be. That's the way I see it. Okay. I mean, we have some more time to come back to this, right? Uh, not really. No? Not really. Okay. We have 30 days to uh, From the to answer back, right. which is going to be the next meeting. Right? We're going to bring it back the next week to finalize it. <coughs> okay. Which is the 22nd, if I'm not mistaken, right? I'm okay with the language as it, as it is. 
So do we have consensus on that? Can I ask the city attorney for clarification? So supermajority vote would say um, I'm absent or a, a board member's absent for the night. So there's only four members. Uh, would a supermajority be three that night or could it be, it has to be four? The way this reads right now, it's four members of the board. It doesn't say supermajority of those present. It says four members of the board. Mm -hmm. So in, in your example, it's one person absent. All of you are going to have to vote in favor of it. But if the word supermajority was used in, in, as an alternative to four, is that? Then you got people trying to figure out what math <laughs> at the meeting. <laughs> and I would not suggest that. Okay. This is Subjective. more clear, in my opinion. Got it. Thanks. It's more clear. Um, I still can't support the elimination of the green space, but uh, the three public meetings and the four members, I, I'm a good with. Okay. So you agree with that? I'm good. Commissioner Carr? What was your question? <laughs> I'm looking for consensus. For the four members? For these, I am, you know, Jay. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm sorry. No, no. no. I am. Uh, let me see, Sheba. Commissioner Donnelly. So you got four or one? On that particular <laughs> one. Um, <coughs> Mr. Colinas, I got a question. I am okay with all these recommendations, but why do we need to have these recommendations on the charter since we already have them on the code? Isn't it duplications and why? Which one are they on? Oh, just about everything uh, on section eight. There is duplications. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the general feeling basically was is that when a commissioner comes into office, that sometimes they don't get that guidance from either the city manager or the staff on where the comp plan is, where any plan is of what you do. And we were hoping that maybe if it went into the charter, it would be a simple way f for a commissioner to go to one spot, find out what jobs and duties are. It's, it wasn't meant to, to for anybody to feel like we don't think you're doing your job. But what we were thinking about basically was is that there is a list of things you should do on a regular basis. And coming in as a brand new commissioner, you should know what these list of things to do are. And there seems to be some confusion at times, and that's normal, okay? I, and I, I'm, as a former commissioner, I can tell you I was confused at times. We never had a list either, okay? The times have changed. Computers weren't big deal in the 70s and the 80s. But any of you now can go home and pull up anything you want to know about, including the comp plan and everything else. So we thought we'd make it easier. It doesn't hurt anything. It's a duplication of what you have access to you now. It's just another place to find it. No, it doesn't hurt anything. My opinion is not any harm. I just wonder why we got them in two different places instead of just one. I wish there was only one place for everything in the world, but there's yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Any other uh, sections of uh, any other parts of Section 8? I'll speak to Kay for a minute. Kay? Um, I, <coughs> I think it particularly, I, I like it. Um, but I'll just tell you that improving, maintaining, repairing, cleaning, and lighting every alleyway that we have in the city of Tarpon Springs is a little bit of a slippery slope. Um, you know, for years, residents have been told that the alleyways running behind their house is their responsibility as it relates to tree trimming and, you know, overgrowth and things of that nature. I myself have told that to people many, many times of, as they have called me over the years to ask if we can get a city crew down there to clean the alleyway. So I support it. Our code speaks to the utilization of alleyways, um, especially from a redevelopment standpoint. But I'm just letting you all know that <coughs> that is a little bit different than we've, a different tune than we have sang in the past. But I'm good with it. Okay. And Mayor, I want to bring up something on letter zero, oh, oh, if I can or if there's other further discussion. Oh, okay. okay, sure. <coughs> uh, there's some, I think there's some, some good language in here. Um, 
about the dredge and about the river. And one thing that I think that it's easy to forget about is the bayous, um, because it, this addresses the river and the bayous um, with the safe um, depths in the bayous, because the bayous have had, I don't know, 50 years of silt built up in them. Um, if you were to go in the bayou now, you'd probably sink past your ankles, maybe further of just the muck and silt that's been run off from the roads for many, many years. So. Uh, I know the, the strongest emph emphasis has been on the river because that's the, um, the money maker for the town and to making sure that we're viable as a town with businesses and so on. But I, I think it's nice that the Charter Review Committee brought in the, the bayous as a, a part to not forget about um, in this area. So I just want to point that out. Yeah, thank you. I'd also like to comment on that one as well. You know, the. Uh, the Ankle River is so important to our, to Tarpa Springs, to our local economy, and I, and I agree with, with all that. But we also have so many other roads under the jurisdiction of uh, Pinellas County and the state. And I haven't seen anything that, and you know, transportation of the people is so important as well. And that should be, and that's on every day. Uh, this is the uh, daily application and responsibilities of the uh, of us. Of, Board of Commissioners and the city manager. Um, why so different from the Anklo River? It's, it's really not other than the fact that the Anklo River does get that attention. If you think back to when, <coughs> excuse me, if you think back to when we, we dredged the last time, it was very specific and bid on the main waterways, but all those waterways and cuts that led to the residents' homes were left out because they, I was told that it was too expensive. But so are the taxes when you live on the water, okay? So if you're going to charge me for living on, and I'm saying this in a first-person case, okay, this is conversations we had as a committee. If you're going to charge a public because they live on the water, it's because they're house has and property has more value but you can only go out on a high tide because it has that cut coming into your property hasn't been clean those cuts were left off the last bid that's why we're trying to get it in here they went down some I forget the name of that little body of water that's uh, between Riverside and Anyway, we put, the city put a drain ditch from, from Riverside into that canal. Now, I just happened, because my brother lives across the canal from there, I can see the buildup of silt going in there. But when the contract was lent out, the contract said you're going to clean 10 feet down the middle. Mm -hmm. Still didn't get the public accepted high tide to the water. We're just trying to say, treat everybody the same way. You guys didn't make that decision with a lot of discussion because you, you don't spend that amount of time here. You don't get all the information in a timely manner sometimes. But the point of the whole thing is, if you're going to dredge, dredge the cuts so the people who pay the taxes and make up $62 million, portion of it, gets the same it's just like, why did we cut the trees in the road but not in the alleys? But the city maintains the alley, but not the trees. Is that, come on, logic. Does that make any sense whatsoever? That you drain down the middle but not to the, you dredge down the middle but not to through the cuts? To us it did not, and that's why it's in here, okay? If it's, if it's not, palatable to you because it may cost too much and all that. Listen, anything you tell us tonight, we look forward to talking about. And and just because we wrote this and said this is what we want, doesn't mean we won't agree with you if you want to make changes to it. The last thing I would personally like to see is to send something to the public that says the Charter Committee wants this, but the city wants this. That doesn't show any unification whatsoever, and that's not what we're after. We're not after splitting the city. So 
that's why it wasn't a total dredge it didn't give access to the public to the deep water thank you any other questions no no no, no. yeah mayor um, yeah, section O is actually um, something when I first spoke to the Charter Committee, I, I thought it would be best suited as a separate section, but I really like that they did kind of make it part of the one-stop shop for Commissioner Powers. I, I think it fits in there just fine. One thing that I did want to bring up um, was just for the sake of keeping it relevant, I mean, we're still waiting on the dredging um, to begin work. I mean, it's been since 1999. I think it's important that if you look at O number three, where it says the city shall maintain a navigation chart of the local channels and cuts and a bathymetric survey shall be done at least every five years of those navigational areas beginning 2021. I think it would be good if we accompanied those surveys and put in there that they're gonna be presented at a public meeting. And also after the public presentation, we are gonna send just a, a letter signed by the commission to the county just to give them an update and give them a heads up. Um, so basically what I'm asking is for number three, once we do complete that survey or get that survey done every five years, we also have it included in a regular session. We have it presented to us. We get all the updates. We send all the updates to the county in a written letter saying, hey, just to keep it you know, on your table, uh, this dredging is a maintenance dredging. It'll need to be done again. So I just want to make sure that we put that in there just to make sure that we keep it relevant. And I appreciate the board's thoughts on that. It, can I add something to that? This, this survey that the commissioner's talking about may very well show you that maybe not every cut needs dredging that time, okay? It will tell you where your low and high spots are and where you have to dredge. And, and it's part of the package it, it comes with it you can't just dredge down the middle and think it's okay because the high sides go right back to the middle again can you pull the microphone a little bit closer to you so when you speak i was hoping nobody could hear me <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'll speaker. talk into it uh, i agree i think that is uh, you know as much transparency and as much as we can let the public know what's going on uh the better it is so if we can include that um, that language that uh, Commissioner Donovan said, I'll support that too, Mayor. If I no. if I may, I'm okay uh, with that too, Vice Mayor. Go ahead. Yeah. Can I add one thing? Can I add one thing to it though, uh, Connor or Commissioner Donovan? You you address something in this as well about being a commissioner and communication to the county. Um, I would also I think it's a good idea to include the state and maybe our senators or congressmen as well. Uh, communication as a commissioner to our other local officials, the mayor's aware of it, the rest of the board's mayor aware of it too, is uh, very important from a board's responsibility to get additional funding for other projects that go on from the dredging to water projects to other projects that are around. So, uh, I mean, if we could expand it to be more than the county, I think it would be wise in that aspect too uh, from that end. Yeah, absolutely. I think maybe the wording could even just go so far as to say, um, you know, whatever analysis and discussion comes from that public meeting and whatever information is on that survey, we send it out to all of our uh, representatives at the county, state, and federal level. And that way, it's just kind of similar to what we did with the Fred Howard Park letter we sent out. We just all sign it. We include the findings of the survey, and we give them our analysis and maybe even projection of when the dredging would need to be done. Nothing wrong with that. I'm okay with it. Everybody's okay? Are you proceeding? Yes. Okay. Any other uh, part of the uh, Section 8? Oh, I actually did have one more comment, Mayor. If we're moving on from um, from the river one, this this is something we discussed recently, Six and I don't think we had uh, part. L. L, so it's on page 7 at the bottom. Um, I support it. But I did just want to get some board discussion on it because uh, recently I think we had a conversation about this within the past couple months and we did not have consensus from the board to do this. So I just want to make sure everybody was aware that this was in here and I absolutely support it. I think it's fair to the city manager and to our, our residents in the name of transparency. But I did just want to bring that to you guys' attention and talk about it. Oops. <coughs> we 
topic of discussion. Yeah, and, and just for those in the audience or watching at home, that's that's um, to evaluate the performance of charter officers during the month of August of each fiscal year beginning 2020, <coughs> at which time city commissioners shall submit individual written evaluations based on the standard format adopted by the city commission to the director of human resources. We're doing it now. We're supposed to be doing it. Well, we're, yeah, we're supposed to be doing it, but recently we had a conversation about it, um, just as far as written reviews go for our city manager. So I just want to make sure everybody was aware of that. Yeah, city manager evaluation should have been done in September. I've done it. It aware. says here August. Yeah? I'm aware of it. I, I saw it on here. So yeah. No problem. Okay. So that's good to have that on there. All right. May I add to that? The evaluations are are excellent when they're done and and what we tried to add to this was your human resources department probably in the private sector I'll tell you that the human resources department is the one who sends the forms out to each one of you to do your evaluation and then they're tracked that way so that the public can under the Freedom of Information Act, ask for the evaluations done by each one of you to the city commissioner, uh, to the uh, city manager. So it's, it's, it only takes three votes to hire and fire a city manager, but it'd be real nice if they knew where they stood in between those three votes. So, and, and that's basically why it's in there. It needs to be directed by, and it's also for the city clerk. Mm -hmm. city. Just a business decision. Mr. Thing. Mr. Mr. Colinas, I, I agree with you that it takes three votes to uh, to uh, <coughs> to you know to terminate uh, a city uh, a city manager, but by doing the uh, evaluation, it helps the employee. Well, Absolutely. <laughs> Somebody's questioning you. That's good to know. Oh, uh, this. <laughs> was that Mark? Was that <laughs> you know, the telephones are too smart nowadays, you know. <laughs> but um, I think the evaluation, it's a tool that you can help the employee to, to do better. And you're discussing with the employee. It's like a, a personal contract, if you will. What has been, the, you know, uh, his performance are and what you're expecting the employee to do. Um, something that I do every year with uh, Mr. Lecouris, and I think he's very successful with me because he knows exactly what I want. If, if you think about the results. I've done it for many years. If you think about the results for two reasons, okay? The same results will tell you whether you want to keep that person or not because once you evaluate them in year one and you say, I really like what you're doing except I'd like you to get out in the public more often. Mm -hmm. Well, in year two, if he's still not getting out in the public, guess what? There's a notch on this side. It's, it's a, it's, if you're out in the private sector, you understand what I'm saying. It's a fair opportunity to keep an employee for his values. And if he has those values, you're going to keep him. But you can't guess at it unless you give him that challenge to show you where his values are. I'm sorry, I'm lecturing. Yeah, you're right. It's on his uh, employment agreement as well. Yes. Commission Chair. Yeah, I agree with the written evaluation annually, but, uh, you know, I meet with our city manager, with our city clerks um, quite often. And so they're being evaluated all the time. It's not just once a year. So if, if, if our city manager isn't doing something I've requested or isn't, you know, answering my questions, uh, it doesn't you know, keep happening. You know, you, you let that, that person know that you, you need to answer. So, um, you know, you, you just can't wait till once a year to, to evaluate them. So I think it's important that there's good communication between ourselves and, and um, mm -hmm. the people we're evaluating at all times. And, and I appreciate that. And, and that feedback is very important to him. It's just, just an evaluation in writing gives him and the public a better opportunity to understand what's going on in the city. <clears throat> I had many of them, I can tell you what. If my boss told me, Jim, I don't think you're doing this right, it was right. 
at the next year, okay? And, and that's, what, uh, that's what evaluations do for everybody, not just for the city manager. We're a, you're evaluated by the public. If they think you're doing a good job, they bring you back. Yeah. I support it. Thank you. Any other part that we'd like to discuss on Section 8? If not, we go to Section 11, Terms of Office Qualifications, Date of Annual Election. This is on page 8, and I agree with that. We, we put that in there only because from day one in Tarpon Springs there have been nonpartisan elections, except it's never been written down anywhere. And we hoped this would be the easiest one we would ever discuss. Any comments? I've got a comment. <coughs> In a car. Uh, I, I'm fine with the nonpartisan election and making that, um, just calling that out. Uh, the one portion that I, I made a recommendation to the charter committee upon was the 25 um, signature cards for uh -huh. um, being the minimum signatures. And I know the city clerk's office provided an example of Clearwater, Dunedin, Olds Barn, Safety Harbor, and I want to read off what those are. Clearwater requires 250 petition cards. Dunedin requires 150 petition cards. Oldsmar requires 150 petition cards. Safety Harbor requires 100 petition cards. And um, I, I think this is an opportunity for the city to really um, to increase this to equivalent to other local communities. Um, I think the balance is trying to figure out what the what the most appropriate signature card requirement is. Uh, 25 is pretty easy. You could probably do that in the afternoon if you wanted to. But 100, 150, 50 even, you have to put a little more effort into it. And as we all know, there's a lot of effort that we have to put into this board from studying, committing, and other aspects um, to really prepare. And I think it would... Um, I'm not saying it's something that would vet someone entirely, but I think it would really, um, it, it really shows that someone's looking to earn this position to be elected to be able to run for commissioner or mayor. Commissioner Carr, uh, respectfully, I have to disagree with you because uh, if we increase that to 100, that's another 20 minutes of uh, work and go to uh, some restaurants and get the, the rest of the signatures. That does not make the uh, applicant any more qualified that will then we have 25. Um, to me is <coughs> what makes the person to be qualified, you look at his potentials and, uh, it, and it's up to the, uh, uh, up to the uh, you know, to the voters to select which was the right person. I think the difference of uh, 50 signatures or 100 signatures it's not going to make any difference. Unless you get 5,000 of them or something like this, that you're going to be working three or four months just collecting signatures just to get an extra 20 minutes of work on that applicant. It's not going to make the person any more qualified, in my opinion. Vice Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I actually had a note on this as well. Uh, it's something that's been on my mind for several years. I think that we should also increase it. Um, I understand that where you're coming from Obviously, I agree uh, with Commissioner Carr on this, um, and I think that you know, in a lot of cases, as we discuss things up here, we look to you know not necessarily recreate the wheel, and look to our other community partners to see kind of what they're doing as well. Which the commissioner has just given you uh, some statistics on that, um, and I actually do think that by as as diminuous as it may sound to go from 25 to 50 or even 75, I think it does make a difference. Um, and I think it makes a difference all the way up until, you know, the day of qualifying. Um, so I, I've been wanting to increase this for some time now, and I've never really understood why we haven't. So I would support an increase at a minimum to 50. And, you know, if the board wanted to go to 75 or 100, I would probably support that as well. I'm not going to support that. Commissioner Chief. Uh, when I attended one of the charter meetings, that was one of the things that uh, I agreed on uh, increasing it as well. Uh, I don't feel like someone who's a candidate can just go to a restaurant and get 25 signatures and be done. Uh, I think you do need to look at it and show that your intent is, is there to serve the city. Um, and by having 75, 100 signatures, 
you've done some due diligence at least, um, and not just gone to a restaurant to get 25 signatures. Um, and I think that you need to interact with the public as much as possible when you're running, because the public needs to know you and needs to know who they're uh, going to elect. Um, so I do believe in increasing it as well. For Mr. Donovan. Uh, I, don't th I don't think we should increase it. Um, I just don't know why we would make it um, more difficult, at least in that startup process. I don't think that's an issue right now. I don't think we have a huge amount of people just throwing their names on the ballot after they get 25 cards. Um, Again, I feel like, you know, the public decides who's qualified when they vote for them. I, I just don't think that this would add anything to our system. Um, I just think it would be a bigger hassle, like you said, maybe a couple hours. I mean, you could stand outside public and just ask for 75. I mean, I, I, I think however high you want to go, I, I think it would be a mistake. I don't know why we would increase it. I don't think it's creating any issues right now the way it is, and I don't think we should make it harder for people to run for office. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't feel like uh, if you're going to be a candidate, you should just go to a restaurant or sit outside Publix to get signatures. I feel like you really need to uh, get to know your, your citizens and, and, um, and talk to people to get that signature. So. Um, it, it shouldn't be something that only takes you 20 minutes to do. It yeah. should be something that, that you know, you go out and, and work and talk to the community and, and get signatures from people that you don't know. Uh, not just go to your friends to get signatures because yeah. what does that prove? Uh, so, I, you know, that's why I believe in increasing it as well. Commissioner Silver, you said now with the, uh, someone can go to the restaurant and get 25 signatures goes to one restaurant so by going by getting 50 signatures going to have to go to two different restaurants to get those signatures i don't How think really we should go to, to a restaurant be more qualified. <laughs> i just yeah. don't agree with the just but going anyway, to a restaurant to get 25 that. signatures it's like i just, yeah, I just need 25 signatures here yeah <laughs> i don't think it takes anything away from the process I just, yeah. to add another 25 i think if anything it just adds it adds to the process i mean it was said you could go stand in front of public but you still got to go stand in front of public to do it yeah. right I mean, somebody's still got to go do it. Uh -huh. I, I mean, just don't see that makes the uh, candidate more qualified with the extra 25 signature, in my opinion. If, if you're not reaching out to voters for, huh? say, 25, 50, 100, whatever, I mean, you're not going to win anyway. Yeah. And I just don't see it as an issue right now. But I think we got consensus on it. Yeah, so. because they signed that petition, that doesn't mean they're going to vote for that person anyway. You're right. True. Can I make just a, one more point is if you don't think that it should be raised to 50, then why do we have cards at all would be another question, right? So I would think that would be the discussion if you're not on the side of increasing it and you're making a point of 25 is enough, then why do we even have them? But um, I, I would support 50 cards moving forward. I'm good with 50. I will keep it the way it is. You good with it, Commissioner? I'd support no cards. That was a good point. <laughs> so we've got a consensus for 50. You got consensus for 50, three and two. All right. Okay. I, any other parts on the uh, section eight? Well, in section eleven. Section 11. I mean, section eleven. I'm sorry. <coughs> Are we now going to uh, section thirteen? And this is on page nine. Interferes with the administration. Um, it was just for the city manager now included all the charter officers, which is the way it should be anyhow. Mr. Colina, do you have any comments on that? No, we just we just thought it was would be appropriate that uh, any type of interference be <coughs> divided equally amongst all the charter officials. Yeah. They have the most responsibility and uh, <coughs> are the ones who make the most decisions or And that's why we added that. Okay. Any commission comments on section 13? Nothing else here. We move on to the next one, which is section 14. This is on page 10. Internal auditor. Any comments on internal auditor? Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, again, something that's been discussed for a long time, and I don't uh, object to the internal auditor or what they perform. I'll just make a few observations as it relates to going 
in house with this person. Uh, currently, our budget is for forty thousand dollars a year for this service, and just looking at the list of duties, uh, including but not limited to the list of duties that's provided in section fourteen. Uh, we need to, if we are going to adopt this, the forty thousand dollars is not going to cut it, uh, given the the budgetary allotment as it exists for forty thousand. I think that our money is better or is is more well spent. Uh, offering a broader range of expertise going out for uh, for bid or going out to an external auditor to perform such duties. Um, so I'll just leave that up to the board. I mean, you know, I just see it as, as another employee in City Hall that, uh, <coughs> I mean, 40 grand is not going to cut it whatsoever. So, I mean, if you're, if you're willing to adopt this, then we need to consider going up, you know, I don't know, at least another 20 grand to have somebody full time here in City Hall that's acting as an internal auditor with the appropriate licensure, with the right background. I mean, for example, when we go out, when we go to whatever firm that we hire now that's a public accounting firm, we're utilizing the expertise, expertise of whatever team that they assign within their company to handle such services. And I just don't think that one person in City Hall is going to be able to handle all this for the allotted budgetary amount and offer the same expertise as, you know, for lack of a better term, a national firm. So those are my thoughts as it relates to the internal auditor. Thank you. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor, you mentioned that 40000 is not enough for the year that we already have budgeted, and I agree with that. Uh, even $60,000 is not going to be enough because you still have to pay for the person's benefits. Probably benefits, you name it. And it's probably another twenty thousand for that. So probably eighty thousand will be what we need to to, uh, to budget for that. So we need to double that. And I am concerned by the expertise that the person is going to have because just like a a, a, a city engineer now, uh, they are so specialized. You know, you got technology that has to deal with that, and um, uh, to be able to do the his, you know, he the audits. I'm not sure one person will be qualified in, on all those fields. So I, uh, I agree with you. Yeah. Let me think uh, I'm going a different direction on this one uh, from the vice mayor and the mayor. Uh, I work in a rather large company. Um, and there's, uh, We're publicly traded as a parent company, and there's SOX requirements. And so internal auditors are not my favorite people, to be honest. really don't enjoy them. Um, but as an employee, I understand the importance of them, and I know that, that they're there to make sure, as myself, I, I've eth I'm very ethical and have character and, and integrity, and I know I'm not going to do something wrong to steer the company wrong, but they're there in the event that if someone, it's not necessarily that you're doing something wrong, it's just saying there's a better way that's doing this under the control, right? So there's a control that's written that they would come with and say, well, this would require if it's from the procurement department, if it's from the planning and zoning department, or the permitting department, they may say, you know, you're doing it this way, but this is best practices. And um, we have a, a small group. There's a two people that are full time, but then we have an outside group that comes in. But we're a three billion dollar company, right? Um, with that, I've had questions where I've asked the city manager, and he doesn't feel comfortable answering because. Uh, one example was I wanted the, some more clarity on the city attorney's fees that we had on our backup and tried to get some summaries. And he wouldn't allocate time because it was against another charter committee, uh, another charter official. And I thought that was ridiculous. But I had, I mean, it's, it was his choice and his decision saying, look, I don't feel comfortable doing this. That would be a good example of how we could use an internal auditor to say, help me understand these fees so let's go through them for the year because right now I have nobody in the city I could go to other than the city attorney himself and say let's go through the fees correct um, that's just one example of what I ran into this past year uh, there's multiple examples uh, from using an internal auditor they could do multiple audits throughout the year instead of just doing one audit for example we did the water plant this past year um, I don't recall what's coming up this this uh, this coming year but they could do multiple departments in multiple areas. If you're auditing the, the water bills, if you're auditing the purchasing fee card, uh, if you're auditing um, the permits uh, from the time, how long it takes to actual um, completion, uh, there's multiple things that could be audited, right? And so I don't think it really gives the city justice by just saying categorically we're only going to audit one thing this year, 
not saying we don't trust employees, but I think it really is a beneficial aspect um, because it does help knowing that someone's looking over your shoulder as an employee to say, we're, we're checking your work here and we're going to report back to the commission. So I don't think it's a bad thing to have a full-time employee. Yes, they're going to have to make a lot more than $40,000 a year. Uh, that was discussed. Uh, that would need to be found somewhere in the budget. But at the end of the day, it makes sense um, from my experience to have an internal auditor um, <coughs> within the committee and to, st to serve directly to the board of commission as well. Yeah. I don't know if we have information knowing how many hours the, uh, uh, the auditor is actually spending a year to auditor the city. Anybody know? Yeah. You know, we pay 40000 but how many hours did, does it spend to do that? Do we, uh, is it enough l a workload for a uh, full employee, a full-time employee, or we can actually have a, uh, someone with a dual responsibility? Can I say something? That, I mean, the dual responsibility makes sense. Uh, there's a, a gray area, though, when you get in a dual responsibility because the internal auditor reports directly to the Board of Commission. Mm -hmm. um, and then what other elements would that person then report to the city manager for the other part of the duty? Um, I mean, you bring up a great point with that. I, I think we could get creative as a board uh, on what this position potentially could look like. Um, but thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, the reason I bring this up is there will be times where the auditor is not going to have the expertise to actually to perform some of the duties. He's going to need to get a contractor, uh, some kind of a, uh, a vendor, or to, to get some help. And because the way it is now with technology and also, perhaps if we can uh, use it as a dual responsibility position, so we still get this done. But if we uh, if we know how many hours do we spend now, we can actually make a decision on that. In my opinion. And I just want to, want to share one more thing. Um, there's, again, like I mentioned, there's two full-time people, and it, it covers a gamut from contracting on the procurement side to the payer side to HR to all different things, accounting practices and everything else. And I, I questioned that with the employer when they came in. But they really got to know the whole business, and the point of the internal auditor is they actually get in and get to know the business, and they actually have the study, the bat aspect of it. They get to know the procurement department, and then they go through – uh, best practices to say these are the standards of what procurement would do. This is the standards of what HR should be doing. Um, is each head of department doing reviews with their employees, um, et cetera? And they would go through that to make sure that's done on an annual basis. So I, I was, I had uh, sensitivity to that when they would come in, and this is only a personal experience that I'm talking on. Um, that you're coming into my department, I know my department, I know my my trade. You're not a professional in this. Stop telling me what to do. But they really did do the research and they found out like exactly what we should be doing on that standpoint. So it's a it's easier just to, to say a blanket statement a blanket statement because that's how I felt initially. But when I saw it actually work, I was pretty surprised yeah. how much knowledge they had. It is, I, and I agree that uh, the auditor is very important position. But we don't know actually how much workload the person is going to have. Perhaps, as, as I said, my suggestion is to have a dual responsibility. Marketing position is very important that we don't have. If we can combine those two responsibilities and report it directly to, uh, to the commission, I think uh, it's something that I will support. Is that marketing? Huh? Is it marketing position? Yes. With the, um, the arts department, there's a marketing position in there. Yeah. But, so, but you can't. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. I, I've been waiting to, to agree with the vice mayor um, because I feel like all your responsibilities are, I think, would you have to be paying $100,000 to somebody. Um, and we have the power to select our internal auditor or the company that, that does our audits. We selected this last one. So we do have power and we can communicate with them. Um, so it's not completely out of our hands. I just feel like this person has to have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. Uh, and we have a company right now that does that. That's, that they've got expertise in all these different areas um, and they're doing it for a pretty good fee. Um, so if, if we are gonna have a, an internal auditor, it's gonna take somebody who has all these qualifications and is going to get paid a lot more than forty thousand um, dollars. So I, I'm not sure. I, I agree that we should have uh, an internal auditor that w works full time, 
and why paying internal auditor that works full time and also uh, hire a company that, that does auditing. It's uh, to me that's worth spending a lot more money that way um, and not necessarily getting any more uh, service. So um, <coughs> I agree that we should continue with you know the system that we have now because we still have that that power to select the the auditor or the company that's that's doing the the, inter the auditing, um, and I, I don't think we should we're kept in the dark. We can ask questions. Give uh, directions. Right? Excuse me. You can give them direction. Right. As well. We can give them right. direction. We can call. I mean, they're they're open to discussion. Um, so, having an internal auditor that that's maybe. Um, reports to our city manager that we might not have that easy a discussion <laughs> with uh, I'm not sure is, is a benefit um, and we definitely would have to p probably put pay close to a hundred thousand dollars for somebody with this expertise uh, that works in, in as a full-time employee so I, I agree with you uh, Townsend can I make a couple clarifying um Clarifying a couple statements that were made, the internal auditor report directly to the Board of Commission how they're being reported today. And then secondly, um, I'm saying an internal auditor that we hired, we may not have that freedom to, you know, if it's a full-time employee, they would report to the city manager. No, they would report directly to the Board of Commission. What's the condition? Okay, even if it's a city employee? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Similar to how... Um, Irene or the city clerk. So would be a charter, a charter member. Position. Charter member. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry about then, that. Then, um, secondly, it, so the way it works today with the internal auditor or the external internal auditor, third-party internal auditor, is uh, the board tax th tasks them with one audit a year to look at. Um, if it's a full-time position, they'd be doing a lot more than just one task. Um, so, for instance, I reached out to the internal auditors to say I have some questions about some things. They're like, yeah. Those are valid questions, but unless you give us additional budget, we're not going to look at any other audits until the next year's audit comes around, and this is what's planned and scheduled. So unless you direct us otherwise by the um, majority of the board, this is the route we're going. So just something to be aware of when you don't have right, a And who knows position. if we have an internal auditor, how quickly they can audit everything. They may only be able to audit one area or one department every six months. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how you know, how that's done with the external auditor that we have, but if we have an internal auditor, what's to say that he can do, do audits any faster? So, you know, that <laughs> it's hard to know. Well, there's some other things that uh, a full-time or a, um, an auditor that is working directly for the Board of Commissions will be beneficial is now we have an auditor that it's, it's a third party. You, let's say he finds uh, some uh, deficiencies and he reports it back on the report. We don't know if those deficiencies are actually being corrected and are being done properly and see what those results will be after those corrections are done. So there are some benefits to have an auditor that is reporting directly to the BOC. You have more control. But the question that I have and still in my mind is, is it enough workload for a person to uh, to be as as a full time auditor because now we pay forty thousand dollars versus two hundred, you know. Uh, if we uh, if we find another responsibility for a person, and that would make more sense economically, more sense for the person to be there. The in problem, my opinion, Commission Donovan. Two different types of. Right. Commission Donovan. Uh, yeah, I, I support a full time internal auditor. I think. The Charter Review Committee did a really good job on this section. I think before we get too bogged down worrying about what we might have to pay this person, I mean, we're just kind of throwing out numbers right now. I definitely agree that it's more than 40000 um, but I think it'd be prudent to look at cities of similar size and demographics to ours um, and then see kind of their salary range and maybe get that back to the Charter, charter Review Committee. Um, I mean, I, I just I don't think we should worry too much about what we're paying this person right now because we're just kind of throwing random numbers out there. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, One second, oh, please. Yeah. I'd like to ask Mr. Trask, because he actually works with uh, many other cities, how the other cities that actually handle the uh, internal auditor? Can you, do you know? I, I don't have any cities that have a full-time internal auditor. They're all outside. They're outside. Mm -hmm. And what size cities they are? I know you have Oldsmar. I don't and know. Dunedin, Bel Air Bluffs, and uh, I was doing Madeira Beach. 
Um, those are five right off the bat I can tell you that had an outside internal auditor. Okay. That was my question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other comments? I on was that? just going to mention something to you, Mayor, in terms of the uh, yeah. in terms of the dual position. Yeah. Being that that's just an option. I don't know if it'll work. You know. Yeah, I'm, and my only observation is is that you know you have a charter official as the internal auditor or the external auditor, right? Mm -hmm. So in an effort to blend that position, I don't see how unless the other position that you were going to prescribe to this person is also as a charter official. You know, it's going to be hard to say, okay, uh, wearing this hat, you work for the Board of Commissioners. Wearing this hat, you work for the so city manager. can't do that. Right. What I was suggesting was uh, mark it as, a, as an example. It's so important to us. Mm -hmm. That can be part of, uh, you know, become a charter. If I don't know if uh, mm -hmm. our charter supports that or not. Do we? There's a, such Mr. different Coliano. responsibilities. I, I'm, I'm listening to all of this. You have a charter official in your charter right now. Okay, this isn't a new position. It was modified previously by, a, a, interesting if you ever asked for that information where you can read the letter that was written by Mr. Yakovone at the request of someone. I don't know who, I haven't been able to run that down yet, which I personally don't agree with that when anybody writes a letter to the city, it should be saying, this is my response to Mayor Alice Hussis's question so that the public knows who that is. But besides that, you have a charter official in your, in your charter now. You have that auditors in there. Don't be fooled by that. And, and in that same letter, Mr. Yakovone said, well, you don't really need a full time because the charter doesn't say shall. You shall have a full time charter official, okay? I can tell you that we were furnished as a committee four or five audits done by y your outside sources, okay, your third parties. I just looked at the first one and it was recreation department and it was like they picked up something around $25,000 that they missed charging or charged wrong or could have gotten more revenue. Okay, none of you can tell me, and I can't answer because I don't know what that answer is because there's nothing written down. Did they change that bad habit? Secondly, a, a charter official doesn't just look at money. He looks at time and motion studies, okay? What, when you go into a department to do an audit, Commissioner Carr is correct. You just don't go in there and look at the dollars. You go in there and look at the operation to see, are you running your operation right? Does, does Mr. LaCourse have enough time to go over and spend time in recreation and in and, and every department in here? He doesn't have an assistant. No one person can do what a charter official does as an auditor. I experienced that at one point in time a number of years ago right here in the city. And it makes you be responsible for what you do. And in coming to, and it's in here, I'm not worried about it, okay? You guys can say you don't need it and you can designate by Mr. Yakovone's letter all you have to do is designate that party that you hire to do it, that company, one person's name, and then that's the charter official for the city of Tarpon Springs. So you're hiring that one person to do it because that's what the charter says and that's what the legal department said you had to do. If you think that you're getting $40,000 worth because they did one audit, on the water department? No, come on. You guys are business people sitting here. You know what it takes to, to keep a business running. You don't keep a business running just looking at 10 people over here. You need to look at the whole city. That's what our envision was when we went after this. Hey, this is near and dear, and it was near and dear to everybody on the committee as well because 
it's the most important thing you can do for the public is to make sure that you're doing your jobs right, okay? And you talk about 40,000 versus 100,000. Oh my goodness, isn't that terrible? You got a $62 million budget. You can't find enough money to hire an auditor. Come on, guys. It, it, I, do what you want to do with this, but it's insulting when you say things like that because this is a big business. This isn't, this isn't a mom and pop business. This is a city you're running. Run it like a city. Get the top people you can get in here and run it that way. And I know you have to save money too, but you're saving it because you're not cleaning the alleyways. Bad. I, I, I'm sorry to say it that way, but yeah. it's very important that the public is assured that everything you do, especially financially, and that includes your labor force, are they working eight hours a day? Auditors look at that. Do they come in on time? Do they make their meetings on time? We experienced a incident that didn't happen. Not only didn't come on time, forgot to bring the paperwork with to us. So those things don't happen unless they're allowed to happen. And whoever you want to blame for that, I, I don't know, but it's in the, it's in the charter right now. What we did was added the job descriptions because Mr. Yakovon said that was one of the reasons that you could go the other way. So if you want it out, you gotta tell the public. Mr. Colinas, when you suggest the letter went from uh, Mr. Yakovon, I haven't seen that. When, how long ago was that? Uh, 2011, I believe, okay. is when all this went away. That's a long time ago. That yeah. was before that. Yes. Oh, absolutely before you. You haven't experienced it. Okay. And 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 I, I'm not hollering at you. Yeah. I'm no, no, no. I'm I not just lecturing. don't remember seeing that. But that if, if you saw what one did, yeah. you would say it's worth every bit of 100000 if that's what it costs. And listen, I think we're all big boys and girls, and we know that I a guy with a degree in auditing he can do just about everything that's on this list. Mr. But Trask, can I ask you? But you tell the auditor every year what group, what department, what method for him to look at. Mr. Trask. Yes. Uh, at this point, we really don't know how much workload this person is going to have. Uh, is are we restricted to have a part-time auditor if this doesn't have enough workload for the person to be full-time? Well, so the answer is, is they're, they're proposing a full-time employee. You, you do? Yeah. So um, your suggestion may be, or an, an option would be, first of all, I've heard so far three of you say no full-time employee, um, that it'd be an outside source. Maybe the recommendation would be to go back to be an employee and then have the city manager, or you, actually you would be, because it'd be a charter official, uh, determine you know how many hours a week that particular individual would work, um, and would you be able to find someone with the the, um, uh, the skill set that you're looking for here yeah. on a part-time basis? That would be, I guess, the other question. But they're suggesting full-time. Three of you say no. Um, the option would be just take out the words full time, and then you would have a little bit of leeway. Commissioner Silver. Yes, um, I understand what you're saying, uh, Mr. Colianos. Um, I don't think this can be done as a part time employee. I think it, it would need a full time employee. My question was that we have to pay this employee a lot more money, um, and they wouldn't be able to do an audit of every department, you know, within a month either. So that, you know, it's not like we would be getting daily updates of all departments. So it, it would take a time, a lot of time to get reports back, even from this person. Obviously, if they're working within the city and they are working with all the departments, you know, I, I think that would be great. But, you know, we're, we're probably gonna get more data from them 
kind of a full-time employee than we do from this company that we currently have. Um, but it won't be, you know, that much quicker. But they will have a better understanding. So I'm, I'm really feeling that it would be okay to have an internal auditor. Um, but we just have to make sure that we can hire someone. And we're having, as a city, a hard time hiring people that stay um, for reasons of either their skill set is, is, is higher uh, and they've been recruited by other uh, towns or, or, or personal or private bi businesses. So, uh, you know, I'd want to make sure that this person has a skill set, as you mentioned, uh, and that we're offering a good amount of money for them. Um, so definitely scratch out the 40000 if we're going to do that. Now, explain again, are you for it or against it? <laughs> <laughs> I know I've confused everybody because I was against it at first. Uh, but, you know, having, and I don't think it can be a part time position because, you know, the skill set here is completely different from a marketing person. So you, I guess you'd have to have two part time employees. But I don't think a part time employee could do this job. I think it would have to be a full time employee. But we don't know that. Well, because you, you look at everything that they've got to do and. And they're asking for a full-time employee. So I agree that it would take a full-time empl employee, and, you know, the as far as that goes. The reason I, uh, I throw this option for part-time employee is right now we pay $40,000, and I don't know how many hours do they actually right. spend. And uh, at least we're going to have the option to, uh, to see how much uh, work is out there for that employee. And I understand. If we have, if we think... Uh, ha uh, part time employee will do the job, then it's fine. If now we'll go to full time. If we can I do, if we can have that option at least. Yeah, I just feel with the company know. that we have hired, we've been getting reports, you know, very infrequently where we would be getting reports more frequently from someone. Of course, someone the who's service would be much better. Right. Of course. So no question about it. We would be more on top of things. Right. Mr. Donovan. So, Mayor, can we go down the line just to commissioners right now and, and just so we can get back on track of our general consensus here? I support a full-time internal auditor. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Yes, I do too. Full-time? Yes. Vice Mayor. I'm wavering a little bit based on the discussion, but I still, I mean, uh, it would be nice if we could get the, have the best of both worlds and have a part-time in-house internal auditor, mm -hmm. but I'm with you. I don't know that, you know, unless there's commission director, yeah. because the person that works for the board of commissioners, sure. You know, I mean, is that a full time? Is that a year's worth of work? That I don't, we don't know that. Right. That's well, that's the question. Yeah. You know, is that a year's full? I mean, is that a full year's worth of work? And then maintaining that. Uh, the open lines of communication between the board of commissioners on a daily weekly basis you know is that something that we're all going to do in order to keep this person occupied with what we wanted to look into and then does it take uh, a consensus among the board to give direction or is that hey i pick up the phone and i say hey i want you to look into x y and z mm -hmm. and they do it you know what i mean mm -hmm. so you know i think it's unfortunate it's unfortunate that we don't have time to come back to certain things that we're building on and elaborating on and you know having productive discussions about because I think in some in some cases you do need to step back and you know digest some things that were said and continue to you know let your mind expand on it but and and, and this is this particular case is one of those um, you know I, I feel I feel strongly about both scenarios can I make one more comment mayor uh, you know, I would support a three-quarter time, so that would be maybe four days a week if that was. And I want to point out something, too, is that you have a lot of, um, how would I say, individuals that retire uh, that move down from northern cities. Uh, right. Usually a lot of people are involved with large corporations. Um, it could be the husband is driving the wife nuts, and the wife's like, you got to get out of the house and find a job. Or the wife's driving the husband's nuts, and you got to get out and find a job somewhere, right? And they have expertise in this, so they've done it many, many years in a larger corporation that they're just looking for a maybe three-quarter time, not a job that's five days a week sure. or six days a week. Sometimes there be requirements, but it could be a four-day-a-week job. And so I wouldn't be against something that's a four-day-a-week job or three-and-a-half-day-a-week job uh, because it, it uh, opens up your applicant pool as well for someone that might be looking for. 
two and a half days a week or three days a week um, position that could get some of these audits done internally and still report back to the board. So I'm not against that um, from a discussion standpoint. If it's a compromise, I think a full time works at the end of the day, but to really broaden the applicant base and really mm -hmm. um, to talk about a compromise on the board, I think that would be something I could I could look yeah. at. Mr. Collier, do you think it will be acceptable to uh, the uh, Charter Review Commission that if we, re, you know, if we take the word full time and give us the option, dependency, if the work, if, if to see if we really need it full time or not? I, I personally can't tell you what the Charter Commission is going to do, okay. but I can tell you that Jim Colianis put full time in there because the attorney said specifically in the letter that it didn't say full time. So you can't have a full time a charter official unless your charter says he's full time. And it's not my letter, I didn't write it. This is all this has all been done. I can only surmise that somebody in power at that time decided that maybe we didn't need one and went to the attorney who said and rightly so, because that's what we pay the attorney to do. Well, if you don't really want him, he didn't say shall, and it doesn't say full time, so. Yeah. Well, it that's seems not like the way it should be. Well, it seems like uh, what we have here, the consensus is, we want to have internal auditor, which is not sure if uh, a full time is going to be enough, uh, it's going to be enough workload for the person to work. So if we have the option to have uh, someone, just like Commissioner Carr said, four days instead of five days. And if we see that we need to have five days, then we can actually move the person to a full time. Can I make a suggestion? I, I, I can't answer that. Huh? Perhaps Mr. Trask can, can. If in fact that position requires 32 hours versus 40, for that position, could it be considered full time? I'm not concerned about Mr. Yakovon's opinion letter. I'm concerned about the actual reading of the charter. And if the charter reads that it, it's an employee, it's an employee, whether it's 10 hours or 40 hours, it would be whatever the direction of this commission would have for that employee as to how many hours they work. So I don't want to get caught up on that, okay? I don't so, either. Yeah, so if it just said that he's going to be a charter, or he or she's going to be a charter official and an employee of the city, that covers the situation, and you can decide how many days of the week, okay. how many hours so of the month you're going to work. it doesn't have to be full time. It does not have to be okay. full time to get this accomplished. So I don't want you getting stuck on Jim's letter. Um, okay. So <coughs> that gives us the latitude to do that. You have the latitude to change it to employee, and it not, doesn't require it to be full time. Okay. Vice Mayor, if you have. I was just going to build on that a little bit and say that if it if it appears that we're circumventing. Uh, an in-house uh, auditor by saying full-time or part-time, I would suggest that we just add, you know, if we were going to go the part-time, which it, the attorney has clarified that we don't, but this is my train of thought, that we include, you know, in-house, right? So it's not an internal auditor that's, that we hire that's, you know, uh, out of the city, but an actual in-house person that walks within the halls of City Hall, has an office here, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I do support, you know, three to four days a week for sure. Okay. And I think it would uh, be a happy medium in, in terms of what the board is trying to discuss okay. and where value is added in specific areas. And if we see so that we need more, we can, yeah, can always change it. So then sure. all we would need to pull out is and a full-time employee if we just put a charter officer of the city. No. It's no? Our, it's our, it, okay. it is that way right now. It, it would need to have in that language and an employee so we're and just taking out full time. Just full time, take out. Remove that word. Yeah. And change the A to N. So and an employee. And then you can decide if this passes, if, if the commission is acceptable to that, you can decide how many hours a month or whatever you want to employ that person. Yeah. I'm okay with that. I'm good with Vice Mayor? Mm -hmm. Carl, I'm, I'm fine call. with that. Commissioner Tuber. Commissioner Lara. Sure. Okay, we're good. Okay. Okay, what's the next one?
uh, section 17, this is on page 11. City clerk and collector, acting city clerk and collector. Um, I agree with that. Um, any, uh, any questions or any comments on that? Huh? Are you good? Good. Thank you. Okay, we're going to section 18, which is the uh, city attorney. That the uh, city attorney must attend all quasi judicial board meetings. You should try it. Don't we do that now anyway? We do do it. It's just not required um, okay. under your charter. Obviously, I think it's important when you have a quasi judicial board meeting that the city attorney's office attend it. I agree. Um, some of the cities don't want us there. Okay. Um, for example, Oldsmar, there is no specific requirement that the city attorney be there for quasi judicial hearings, but that's where the mistakes are made. And that if you, we can prevent mistakes being made and we make sure the due process is given, we can avoid appeals, which in the long run would save the city money. Yeah, something we do anyway, so yep. I'm in favor for it. Commissioner Donovan? I'm good with that. Commissioner Super? Yep. Vice Mayor? Yep. I'm not here. Commissioner Carr? Here. Good. What's the next? Uh, section 20, residency. This is on page 12. Any questions to Mr. Colianos? Commissioner Donovan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah. yeah, I just had a question on this uh, in regards to our city manager's email earlier today. I don't know if everybody saw it. I think it was just a comment on the fact that department directors are in this um, this first line of Section 20 residency. So it doesn't just include charter officers, assistant city manager, police chief, fire chief. Uh, it includes all department directors. Uh, I just wanted to get kind of the uh, charter review committee's opinion on that and kind of why they threw that in there. Most, most of the decisions made on this list was based on in an emergency that these are the people who should be here present during an emergency not only it's a double-edged sword commissioner we uh, we had a lot of mixed feelings on it and basically because basically because it's hard to hire people we know that and somebody may live in Trinity and be the best candidate to come to work in Tarpon. But we want them to be a full-time employee here. But we don't, as we discussed it, we don't want to lose them as an employee. And that's why the caveat was added there that you could excuse them in up to three years. And that's an indefinite excusal solely at your decision. You can say after three years we need you to move in town or you can say hey you can stay there another three years. It's, we tried to work a way around where we could get the people who run our city live in the city. But the only way to do that in these days because employment is really good right now for everybody is to try to build something in there that says if you can't come right now you just bought a new house or whatever then We'll give you three years. If something comes up then, your kid needs to graduate from school, we don't, you don't want to move them out of their school, we'll give you three years. It's, it's an easy way out of a tough thing during these times because employment is very high. Mm -hmm. So will they have to continue to make that extension? So any employees that are hired after October 1st, 2020, well, let's say I'm a department head and I get hired and I say, hey, look, I live in you know, Clearwater but I'm the best candidate for this job and I get hired, am I gonna have to make those three-year extensions every three years? If you don't move in the city. Okay. Was there any thought given to maybe making that indefinite? What if we're hiring an employee and they want, uh, if they want the exception of being able to not live in the city and they get granted that exception, then they have that exception and they're just as protected as those that were grandfathered in? 
just because that might be a little volatile, you know, like that could change with however so the commission changes. You might as well take this out because everybody's going to want the exception. Yeah. I mean, and that doesn't let them come in. You know, right now, <coughs> the only one that absolutely has to move in is the city manager. Okay. <coughs> but it doesn't preclude an assistant if you got one or the charter officials or anybody else from living in Tarpon. This is where you make your money. We hope you want to live here and spend it. Yep. Bring your family here. Go to our schools. But if you can't, then the exception is there to get the best person we can get. And that was the whole premise. These are at-will employees and we got to try to get the best we can get, and that's the only way we could figure out to do it. If you do away with it, nobody's moving in the town. Okay. And um, Chief, or as acting city manager, did Mark have any other thoughts on that? I know I saw the email, but that's what I was going off of. Yes, he does. And Mayor, can I elaborate on that, or do sure, you want another commission? Yeah. 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 Um, city manager, I'm speaking on behalf of the city manager. Um, he feels that adding all department directors will impact recruiting. Um, I agree with them on that. Um, you have people, I think we have one position for our planning and zoning department. Um, I think the person lived just on the other side of Crossman Road. And people are not gonna sell their house and uproot everything to move 100 feet to be in the city. Um, in, in today's day and age, I remember when I was in Colorado and unfortunately had a quadruple homicide. Connectivity is everything. I was FaceTiming two and three times a day with my command staff, state attorney's office. I was, I was in touch. So things have changed. And, and I think that this, that this um, charter requirement should change with the times. I, I really think by adding all department directors, you are hurting recruiting and you're hurting us getting the best people that we could possibly get. We're not a very large city. And, and I, get, I get both sides of the argument that you want people to be a part of the community, understand the culture, understand the needs and wants of the people. And you know, and, and the Charter Review Commission put that in there where, you know, if you're a city employee and you're hired, you get an exemption, the exception is city manager. Um, but w Mark really feels that all department heads is really going to hurt us in the long run. Um, and, and that's his position. He wanted me to speak on it tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Colinas, I also feel the same way. I, I agree that uh, the city manager and the, uh, di you know, the directors that relate into the emergency needs should be in the city in case something happens and can actually respond to the emergency. But uh, positions like the uh, planning and zoning director and the building director, I don't see any emergency that is going to happen that they have to react on right away uh, in planning and zoning. I mean, I'm sure they can do that in four or five hours. Um, if the, um, let's say that uh, we, as you know, we have now, we're looking for a planning and zoning director because Heather had to, um, she resigned. But um, if we, uh, if we try to recruit someone that who lives on the, uh, even in Tarver Springs on the um, South Florida Avenue, that it's, it's not part of the unincorporated area. So we're not gonna be able to get that person for planning and zoning. So that's some of the thing. I think some of those positions, building director, uh, planning and zoning, project manager, that should be excluded from that, in my opinion. I, I, and I appreciate that. I don't, I don't have a problem with what anybody said about this. It's just that if you're talking about your directors, there's your only headache with this. It, I think that's what I'm hearing. The administrative services director Public Services Director, Development Services Director, and the Planning and Zoning Director is currently in the charter. Yeah. So we took those out. Okay, we added three years. Uh, send us something. Mayor? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Subo wants it. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, we've had difficulty hiring people in certain departments, like our building department, and um, I just feel like it's limiting hiring from outside this area. It's limiting us and we need to be more flexible. Um, I don't think the three years and extending it another three years and another three years is, is, uh, is gonna work. Uh, I really feel that 
we should be able to look outside our area and not force people to move into Tarpon, although it'd be great if they do move into Tarpon. Uh, they'll be spending 40 hours a week here, so I think they're going to get to know the city. Uh, but I just feel like we're restricting ourselves uh, by who we hire. Uh, and I agree with what uh, Mark uh, is, is saying or proposing, that we don't make those limitations. Are you talking about the directors? Yes. Okay, thank you. I didn't say all the directors? Right. Well, not the police chief and the fire chief and not emergency uh, Just personnel. the exception other than the emergency related right, right, directors. Right. Okay. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, this is actually something that I feel pretty strongly about, um, mainly because I look for, I want there to be community buy-in in all regards, especially yeah. as it relates to our department director, especially as it relates to planning and zoning director and the building official. For me, it's very difficult to, you know, uh, take advice from the planning director, hear what they say, have the, uh, have the mutual respect to agree to disagree as it relates to things that have large impacts on this community and the shape that they take and you know the redevelopment efforts or whatever the case may be if the person is giving me you know their opinion and they're not they don't have the community buy-in they're not living in Tarpon Springs so I mean ultimately at the end of the day they do their job and whatever recommendations they've made to the board however it affects this community they leave and go home to a different community that doesn't sit well with me so I'm all about having the department directors as new hires live within the city of Tarpon Springs. I understand that, you know, it might limit your reach a little bit or if somebody lives across the county line that, you know, they're not just going to uproot their family to move here. And I think that the Charter Review Commission has done an excellent job in providing for exceptions. Um, personally, I think that three years is too long. Um, I would recommend doing two years. And basically, to me, that says, you know, we've, we've hired you. You're great. We want you to love the community like we love it move to Tarpon Springs. So I feel like there's a lot of uh, benefits to having said director positions within the community. Um, to me, the, the community buy-in uh, is speaks volumes when you hire this person or they live within the community. They have a more, you know, they, they feel and touch the community a little bit more than just working here eight to five. So to me, this is something that has always stood out to me as uh, necessary within the existing charter. I can appreciate aspects of it that were rewritten um, but I mean I 100% think that de department directors should live within the city limits now do we provide a little bit of flexibility if they don't live here and we want to hire them and it's out in the open that look if we hire you and you take the job you've got two years to move here I don't think that there's anything wrong with that First, I want to I want to thank the charter committee that's here. Um, you all met in multiple meetings. Uh, this is the first chance that the board of commission have had a chance to talk about this. So obviously, we agree, we disagree. Some of us agree in some, some of us agree uh, disagree in others. So this is just a, a really unique situation that we've had that I haven't really had an experience with before in the past. So thank you for all your services, and Mr. Kulianis, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the date? Because currently in the charter today, um, it talks about if you were hired prior to March 14th, 2000, you would not have to comply with moving to the city of Tarpon Springs, but the charter would change to October 1st, 2020. Can we talk about how we got to that date and why we would eliminate the March 14th um, date? Well, the vote on this will come up in early part of 2020 and then October 1st is your start of your new fiscal year fiscal year so we just thought we'd make it simple that way okay um, and mr. Koulianis you brought up the point that currently today in the charter it has a city clerk administrative services director fire chief police chief public services director development services director and planning and zoning director so it already calls out the positions by name but what, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, the Charter Committee just summarizes it a little bit better and might throw a wider cast net to encompass maybe a couple more um, directors. Is that 
Would it, I be correct it's, in that? It's the hardest issue in the whole charter is a residency because you want the best you could possibly get, but you want them to be part of your family. Yeah. And th that's what this is all about. And we tried to do an everything possible to say, if that's the best guy out there, forget the year because nobody's going to move in for just one year and take a chance. You know, I'm going to sell my house, move to Tarpon for a year. They may fire me. And that's why the three years went in. And that's and then we took the limit off. You can do three years after three years after three years. If if somebody's had, let's say, two excusals for up to six years and they're still worried about being fired, somebody's <laughs> not doing their job. They're probably happy at what they're doing and they're going to stay. Sure. Like, like I said, their kids could still be in school. They have a college kid. You know, you know, it's people. I, how do you put everybody's situation in one bag uh -huh. and make them happy? It's hard to do. Thank you. I, I mean, from this standpoint, I, I would, I'm gonna, I will support this from a commissioner standpoint. The part that I would recommend is just crossing out October 1st, 2020. I don't see why we should have a, a date on there uh, from the board if the board feels that the directors or charter office officers or whoever may be should live in the city of Tarpon Springs. Why should we say for any new ones when we have currently a full staff um, or we have a couple of department or department head that will be open tomorrow? Um, why are we res restricting that for our current employees to say, if you're a new employee, we want to see you be part of the city. But I think myself, I would say if you're a current employee, I would want to see you part of the city as well. Um, two to three years, it, it doesn't matter to me. Um, I would support either. Um, Vice Mayor brought up two years. I, I would support that, but I think the date, um, we're just resetting the clock ultimately, again from tw 2000, um, because what happens if you're promoted from another position, and at that point you still live in another community, I, I think it's important to have the, these individuals as directors within the city themselves, um, and then again, like it's been brought up, there's an, uh, an opportunity if the board feels to support this uh, uh, head of department that it could extend a time period for no max amount uh, to extend the person to live uh, elsewhere as well. So I'm, I'm supporting this one. I, I would add one thing. This is the best town to live in, in this Pine Ellis County, okay? We got more to offer than anybody. And if they don't want to come because it's tarpon, do we really want them? No. I mean, Think about it from your heart side. We've all been here, and there's no newcomers in, sitting in this room right now. In the private sector, you're offered a job. Hey, Jim, I got a great job for you in, in Chicago. No, I'm not going to live in Chicago. I'm keeping my family in Tarpon Springs. We all did that. That's why we're here. So they'll come, and we'll sense. give them a break if, if they need it. That's I don't know how else to say it. Commissioner Carr, um, you know, you were saying that we shouldn't uh, have a, a date of October 1st, 2020. Don't we have a number of department heads now that don't live within city limits? I have no. Yes, we do. Heather lives here in the city. Public works. Tom lives outside the city. <laughs> well, a lot of them do. Yeah, they live outside. Yeah, the not, city. not everyone currently lives within the city, and some have worked I think they for should live many here. years. Yeah, I think they should the live city. in the city of Tarpon Springs if they're doing the decisions of what they're making. Yeah. I think it's wise because it's in the community that they're it's going to impact them, right? And they live in another community and you're making decisions and recommendations to the board. You're ultimately making recommendations that really has no impact on themselves. I understand um, what you're saying, but there are some people who are department heads who have worked for the city for 20 years and they know almost everybody personally, uh, like public works. So you know, that person I wouldn't expect to have to, m to move it within the city. Yeah, Commissioner Carr, when these people took this position, it was with the agreement that they can actually live outside the city. They got the promotion, whatever. You just cannot go back now and tell them, hey, listen, we change our mind. Right. We want you to move in. You know, you're disturbing people's life that way. So I don't see that. It would be, I, I agree that, I mean, if we're going to make some, uh, requirements let's do it with the new employees not the ones that already have the position and they have houses and 
their families and all that, and they happen to live in Palm Harbor or in unincorporated areas. Mayor, I, if I may make a recommendation, if you're promoted to a position, then at that point you're <coughs> accepting a new position as well. Because, for instance, if you started today as a meter reader and you worked your way up um, throughout the water department and then became the director of public serv public works, right, and let's say 20 or 2030, um, but the person that was employed today in the city of Tarpon Springs, they wouldn't have to live in the city of Tarpon Springs because they're already an employee of Tarpon before this actually went into place. So what I'm trying to say is if you were to accept a, a, the position for maybe a promotion, then at that point the expectation would be that you'd move to the city of Tarpon Springs as well. So I think that would be a compromise between the two. Make sense? I agree with him. I mean, to me, the department directors, you know, with exception to the existing employees, I agree. Like, if you're an existing employee and you you haven't been a director, or you are a director and you're an existing employee prior to this language, then I get it, right? I mean, okay. there's got to be an exception. But I mean, to me, this is cut and dry. If you want to, if you want to, if you're not a department head and you want to be a department head, you got to know you got to move to the city. That's it. I mean, to me, it's cut and dry. Uh, I don't think it's cut and dry. I just feel like if I have a, you know, if I have a family in Clearwater, I got my kid in Clearwater Middle or Clearwater High School or something like that. I mean, that's just something that I'm definitely going to consider before I work here, um, is whether or not I'm going to have those future opportunities or whether or not I w even want to consider them because I'm going to have to uproot my family to bring them here. I just want to make sure we're getting the most qualified people and we're attracting the best people. And I don't think just because somebody doesn't live here they're going to try to lead the community wrong or they're not going to put 110% effort in. I just want the best people for the job. I agree. Actually, I, I feel that uh, all the employees related to the emergency uh, responsibilities, they should be living in the city so they can actually respond to, uh, to a problem right away. But uh, positions like uh, planning and zoning director, or building director, project manager, if they live in Palm Harbor, I'm okay with that. I agree with you, Mayor. I'm out on that, Mayor. Okay. You're, you're, huh? I mean, we can we can vote on it, whatever you want. But you're yeah. telling me that the planning director, the person who's telling you we should approve this or not approve that or redevelop this or redevelop that, the they're going to leave yeah. town at the end of the day, and they're not going to have any skin in the game as it relates to the recommendations that they've just made, I can't support that. But I feel like that's their job. You know, they have to do their job. So whether they live here or not, they still have to do the job. So, well, you know, hiring from without, I think, gives us more of an opportunity to, to get good people here. You can still hire here. from without, but it's just known that you got to move within, within the city within a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's me, this is still enough of a small town to where you know, I want the police chief's kids at the football game. I want them playing football at our high school. To me, that's just, that's the buy-in. I mean, that's the, that's the community, that's the type of community that I think we are. Okay, so. Can I jump in? Of course. This obviously affects the city attorney's office too. If you take out the date, you know, when I'm, that will require me to move in the city um, and, and that's not gonna happen. Um, I love Tarpon Springs. Um, I grew up here, raised my kids here, but I'm happy where I'm currently living and I don't see myself moving. So um, that date protects me in, in this position. And so I would just tell you that now you're adding all charter officials, including the city attorney. If you take out the date in three years, my time is up. <laughs> and we're clear back <laughs> into uh let's see what consensus do we have uh start with you commission Carr. Uh, i like the way the proposal is currently uh there's a couple items i would i would bend on but i'm fine with the proposal from the board okay i like the i like the proposal as it is i would change the uh 
I mean, I could leave the employment prior to October 2020 or just prior to the effective date of this amendment or effective date of this ratification of this language or whatever, but I, I do agree that if you're a prior employee, I'm not gonna you know, pull the rug out from under you. Um, but I don't think that there's, uh, I think to go uh, from exception to three-year exception to three-year exception to three-year exception, that just circumvents the intent that we're trying to get to. So I mean, I think a couple years exception, again, to be able to reach out and hire from a broader base with the understanding that you've got a couple years to move within the city, I think serves the point. And I think that the Charter Review Committee did a good job by making it department directors versus spelling out the individual directors because a perfect example would be we might have a internal auditor director, right? But if that's a, if you just leave it spelling out the way things are spelt out and the internal, the future positions aren't included there, then you know, they're, they're being left out of the equation. But by stating department directors, I think it includes any future department heads. Mm -hmm. Well, I see a little bit different than that. I, I like to see the uh, city manager and all the other uh, positions relating to the emergency uh, related uh, responsibilities by positions, the ones that are not, like a building department, as I said earlier, planning and zoning. Uh, if we, uh, I believe that uh, we sh they should be exempt from that because it will restrict us to uh, recruit a qual quality director. So that's the way I wanted to see it. Finish your statement. Uh, I also agree. I, I, I just feel like, like Tom just said, uh, he's not going to get up and move. Uh, our recreation director has his family and, and children in schools where he lives. He's not going to move here. Uh, you know, I think it's just really limiting uh, our department heads and also, you know, going out and hiring the best people for the job. Uh, it'd be great if they lived here, um, but I don't feel like that should be a requirement uh, other than our emergency personnel. And okay. Commissioner Donovan. I agree with you, Mayor. So we have consensus on that particular point? So, um, so, what that is. so the consensus that I've heard is, is yeah. that you're going to leave it exactly the way it is, except for the fact that you're going to take out the term department and directors. Yes. So we're not going to require department directors. Only the, uh, uh, if you can. Uh, city manager, police chief, fire chief, and city manager. Yes. Charter uh, officers. Yes. So we're just taking out the words department directors out of the first line. That's the consensus that I heard. Between you three? Yes. C can I ask for a clarification, Mayor? You said um, in the event of emergency, now is that like a house burning on fire or active shooter, or is that like the EOC is being launched and they have to come in from the well, EOC? Well, what I was saying, curiosity. emergency would be like the other police, fire, and of course city manager would be able to direct. Okay. Okay. So the charter officials aren't necessarily yeah. But you're leaving that in there, correct? Well, and of course, <laughs> city, uh, city attorney should be not part of, it's not part of the emergency either. Well, but the only thing that way. the city attorney took out based mm -hmm. on y'all's consensus is department directors. Is that right, Mr. City Attorney? That's correct. So, so therefore, charter officials is left in there? Yes. Um, so it would be city manager, charter officers, um, which would include the city clerk and myself and the internal auditor now if it, it passes. Um, and if they were employed before October 1st, 2020, it really doesn't affect them. If you're hiring a charter official after October 1, 2020, they're going to have to meet the requirement of residency in the city. Well, it wouldn't affect you at this point. Yeah, city, uh, city attorney is not an emergency director. But, but he, he's, he's also official. saying at the date after October yeah. 1st, 2020. Right. That is the applicable date. Correct. So after October 1st, 2020, if you hired a new city clerk, a city attorney, or internal auditor, they would all have to reside within the city. So but right now, any employee that's currently employed by the city, including the city attorney, um, before October 1, 2020, you do not have to live within the city limits. I don't see why the city attorney has to be part of that, in my opinion. I'll trade you the city attorney for department director. 
Huh? I said I'll trade you the city attorney for department <laughs> director. <laughs> Make a deal, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Talking about the next city attorney because this one's been here right. prior to the date, right? right? Correct. That's correct. Which you could also say the same for many department directors. Correct. Just take my point. Yeah, they live in outside the city. I mean, Down you're the giving road. them multiple exceptions. I would support town or vice mayor's proposal as well. Okay, so again, would you read what are we talking about, Tom? Sure. Under the section 20 as being proposed, um, it would be exactly what is proposed by the Charter Review Commission, except for deleting the words department directors in the first line. So it would read the city manager, charter officers, including the assistant city manager, police chief, and fire chief, shall establish permanent residency, legal residency within the city within a one, one year after a appointment, provided, however, that this provision shall not apply to such employees, including the city attorney, employed prior to October 1, 2020, even if such employee is appointed to any position listed above, nor the temporary employees or temporarily appointed employees, uh, I'm sorry, officials. Any person required to establish residency within the city pursuant to this section upon relocation of such person's legal residence shall be required to reside within the city limits of the city. The Board of Commissioners may excuse the residency requirement for such time periods, no one time period to exceed three years as it deems appropriate in the best interest of the city for all aforementioned positions in this section except for the position of the city manager. Commissioner Donnelly, you still okay with that? I'm still okay with that. Commissioner Sheba? Yes. And me too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next is section 23. That's on page 12. I don't have any questions on that. The, the only change on that is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the state passed a law that says employees can't sell anything to the city for any price. And and that's the, uh, so that's why that portion of it was taken out. Just remove the line there. I'm okay with that. Commissioner Carr? I'm good with that. I think it's a great move. Vice Mayor, you okay? Yeah. Okay, we now go to uh, section 26, which is the sidewalk improvement fund. This is on page 13. Questions to Mr. Colliani. Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Colliani, I've noticed that um, the street has been removed and then also there's some restrictions put in here. Can you just elaborate um, briefly on that? The basics here were is that sidewalks haven't been given enough attention in the, in the opinion of the Charter Commission. That we have numerous places and that are in dire and desperate need of sidewalks. Some of the information we got budget-wise was, I don't want to say it was misleading because I'm, I'm not a budget expert, but as it turned out, I'll just give you a quick example. Uh, 2017, uh, we had $30,000 for sidewalks. In 2018, we had none. In 2019, we're going to have 40000 So we basically questioned that type of budgets, that one year you're going to put sidewalks in, one year you're not, only to find out later on that they put a lot more sidewalks in than another fund called Cement. Uh, <laughs> I see the smiles on your faces because you were like me. I'm going, what are you talking about? It's, if you put sidewalks in, shouldn't it be under the sidewalk budget? Can't, that's cement, I mean, but still. Anyway, long story short. We just thought that if we gave you the $2 million back, and did not require you to keep it at $2 million, just go ahead and spend it. But spend it on sidewalks 
existing sidewalks, spaces in between two existing sidewalks, places without sidewalks where people have been living years without. The, the only caveat we put in there was, to make sure you did that, <laughs> was that if you take $100,000 next year and put it in a sidewalk fund, you gotta match it with $100,000. If you put 40 in there, you'll get 40, but you have to build $80,000 worth of sidewalks. Uh, okay. it's, a, it's a reasonable way to do it. It's, it Got doesn't it. seem to make sense if you spend money out of the two million bucks and if you go back and I give you the history on it there were no sidewalks being done a number of years ago <laughs> and because it got in the charter this way that you have to save the money till you get two million dollars and you have to replace it and keep that fund active we've outgrown that and we're giving it back to you in a better way okay mr. Polianis got a question to ask you, and, and I agreed to have it as a matching fund up to $100,000. And, and I don't know if uh, Mr. LeCruz is not here today, but I wonder if there are any projects already calculated to use some of the funds for new projects like uh, Mears Boulevard or Street that is not being done yet. Well, You're there was a that, lot of discussion right? <laughs> on the Charter Committee and Coincidentally, it was about mirrors because uh, the mirrors project's been going on for what three, four years now. Oh. Ten. Three three years. Different, Ten. Three different, three different owners, or longer than that. Yeah. So th the basic principle we decided on was, well, the city's known for the last three to five years. I got to put sidewalks out there. Why the heck haven't they budgeted for it? Why don't you take that sidewalk money and put it in a special account? So when they do open the road, you got it. And you've had all this time to do it. So now we're gonna open up a whole new area and you wanna spend the money from the sidewalk fund that we're trying to give back to you. And it's not gonna go to the people who have been waiting for sidewalks that need the repairs and, and uh, houses that have been there for 10 or 15 years and still don't have sidewalks. So if you drop the ball, guys, it's not our fault. It's, you you can't say we're going to put sidewalks in and not budget for them and put the money away. You can't just hope that the, it's going to fall out of the sky to you. Thank you. I've got a comment if I can make. Yes. Uh -huh. um, I just want to bring up a, a couple points, um, Mayor, and uh, something that's a little bit different. I I think it was a great idea when this was brought up many many years ago to create a a, a fund. What this fund is designed to do is you have two million dollars and use the interest of this fund to to repair sidewalks or put new sidewalks in or repair roads. Um, it it makes sense. It made sense at the time, but today the commission has the other al alternatives to this. The penny fund would be a good example of that. We use that on capital projects. There's some other projects that, um, or other funds that um, Chairman Coulion has brought up about the, the sidewalk fund. For instance, the city spending $190,000 on sidewalks in the 2020 budget, I, I recall, that isn't coming strictly from the sidewalk fund, it's coming from different funds as well. So there's other avenues to fund sidewalks and street improvements in 2020, um, which is the budget we're in today. Uh, I would like to propose a, a couple ideas uh, just from a understanding is that if the city wanted to fund, again, I, I brought up the penny fund, um, and the way this operates today is it's $2 million sitting in a bank account. It's interest earned. So if the city were to go through this um, $100,000 a year, it would take about 28 years to go through and deplete. Simple math says it would take 20, but it, you have to remember that there's interest being earned each year. So you take some out, interest is being built, you take some out, so it takes about 28 years to get through the $2 million. Um, one of the avenues that I would like to, and I, this is uh, one of the discussions that city manager is gonna bring up, I believe, at some point in the next month or so. Um, the city has a, a reserve, a healthy reserve fund of $8 million. And one of the avenues that the city could take approach on is allocating $2 million in the reserve funds the interest that's earned on that $2 million, it could be thirty to $40,000 a year, 
it goes to sidewalks. So then at that point, the city just replaced the sidewalk fund by using the interest earned that's currently sitting on our reserve fund that we have to keep, that we're keeping, um, for sidewalks still. So ultimately you're keeping the sidewalk fund, best way of saying it, and then there's other avenues of the penny fund to do projects as well. Um, I do feel that the $100,000 is pretty restrictive. I think there's an opportunity to do some legacy projects, um, especially in a couple areas. Uh, I would make a recommendation. Um, Jasmine Road in front of the um, Rose Cemetery and in front of um, Discovery Park has been in dire need of some type of walkway for quite some time. That's a lot of uh, pedestrian traffic for children if they're parked out by the road with the football and soccer fields there. Um, South Spring Boulevard, that's an issue that the board has brought up multiple times um, with the riprap rock along Whitcomb Bayou. Uh, and then also some type of uh, trail, if it could be a recreational trail that connects the bayous to Sunset Beach or connects the bayous to Fred Howard Park. Um, as you go around these areas, you see people out there constantly biking, walking their dogs, running, walking their children, children going to school. Um, these are all avenues, but they're all on small sidewalks. Um, and these sidewalks also flood on small rains too. So a lot of them are going into the roads to avoid the flooded sidewalks. So with this sidewalk fund, uh, and then also uh, uh, another part is the lack of um, bike lanes. We have a lot of um, roads that go out to the beaches that individuals from Tarpon Springs or other communities come into Tarpon Springs and bike on our roads, but the roads are so narrow that it's very difficult to get by them. And also we have a lot of windy roads. So you're trying to go around a bike bicyclist on a windy road where you can't necessarily see the oncoming traffic at times because the mangroves are growing up too high or there's a blind corner. So from my perspective, I, I mean, I would think it's best served to do a, a few legacy projects if it's South Spring Boulevard, if it's connecting projects because there's, if you look at the east side of town, there's really not a whole lot of sidewalks that lead to Highland Park. Um, Jasmine Road really isn't, um, it's one that's in dire need. Um, and there's also some areas, like I mentioned, about improving some uh, pathways out to the beaches uh, from connecti connectivity to the bayou. So I think there, it would serve the city well to see some legacy projects instead of some uh, small infill projects, because that's what the Board of Commission has been doing for many years now, has been small infill projects. I mean, we're spending $190,000. We just approved it, I think, two meetings ago um, for infill projects all around the city, not just one area. So it, it, the board's doing their job in that, I believe. Um, so I do feel that this is pretty restrictive, and I don't think it's the best, um, it, it's not the best bang for the dollar for the city residents and how it can make a lasting impact for many more years. Thank you. City Manager, you have a comment to make. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, had, I had the opportunity twice to go before the Charter Review Commission on behalf of the City Manager and kind of express the, the views of the City Manager's office. So you really have and what we discussed with the Charter Review Commission was you have $2 million, that's a lot of capital sitting there, um, and you can't really use it, you have to replace it, you can only really use the interest. So what we've really been doing over the years, and this initially includes streets and sidewalk, either we use local option sales tax or we use the general fund, or we use um, you know some other type of funding to try and do projects. But this money you really could never touch, you just use the interest. Um, so now you can only use 100000 of it and you have to match it. So, and there's also nothing, one of the things that Mark hit on too, there's really nothing here for bike lanes or bike trails or bike paths. And that's gonna be a part of livable, walkable communities going into the future and Commissioner Carr just hit on that. But, um, but our position has kind of always been, you have $2 million and, and one of the great things about cities and local governments, you are grassroots service. You really, you really provide service that affects the quality of life, whether it's bike trails, sidewalks, streets, parks, but city marriage office feels you have a lot of money sitting here and, and you're elected officials and you're probably in the best position to determine what to do with that money, reinvest it back into the community. But if, um, if we go down this route, um, city manager today and I had a meeting, he would just ask that would it be possible to put some money specifically for bike lanes or bike um, paths or, you know, we, we haven't really addressed that. We're really only addressing sidewalks here. So that's the uh, Position of City Marriage's office. Thank you. Ms. Siebel? Uh, I agree. I mean, we do need to discuss bike lanes and, and, and have us uh, be a more walkable community, connect to the beaches, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, so it is restrictive. 
uh, just talk about the sidewalks. Um, as far as where the money's gonna come from, like you were talking, uh, Commissioner Carr, um, you know, what, is, what does the city manager say about, uh, have you talked to the city manager about taking it from the uh, reserves? Yeah, oh, well, uh, I wanna be sensitive on how it says taking it from reserves, so we would, or if the board feels that the best avenue, but yeah, I've talked to him about alternatives to um, allocating, for instance, code enforcement funds to certain things, and it would be also the reserve interests. It would just only be the interest earned on the reserve. It wouldn't be actually touching right. the, the egg of the reserve. It would just be the interest earned. The, the set aside, maybe uh, two million, the interest would go towards sidewalks. Another two million would go towards something different. I don't know what that would be, um, but that would be a discussion that we'd have a, as a board to make a decision. Commissioner Carr. This is a different resources that we might have, including the penny for panels, as you mentioned. But now we're here to discuss about the uh, matching fund of the $100,000. That's what you're talking about is later and find different resources to do other projects. So I'm just giving the charter committee an understanding yeah. that there's an avenue to replace this still, like the yeah. interest that's earned. So but there's still an avenue there to do that. So yeah, yeah the, the question is, <laughs> uh, the $100,000 uh, matching fund that, that, uh, that we be able to get, which means that in order to get 100000 we have to spend 100000 I mean, we have to provide all that 100000 so it'll be $200,000 before it's over with. This is what we need to, uh, to talk about. But you made it a good point that, and also the other uh, city manager, that bike lanes is very important that we need to have in the city. And to me, that should be included as a sidewalk because uh, you know, uh, s you know. In order for us to be a walking community, you need to have the sidewalks to be able to walk from place to place. But also, we need to have uh, different uh, ways, like a bicycle <coughs> or something like that, to, to get to different places. So, I agree with the city manager, and I agree with you that the uh, bike lanes should be included somehow in there. Or perhaps we have a a, 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 a different way that we can get some more funding for that. Could I, could, could I interrupt, Mr. Mayor? One second, I'll come I'm back sorry, to you. I, and I, I have before me a memo, September 24, 2019, where apparently you all approved $165,000 for 10 different streets yeah. for sidewalks. Okay, and that money came out of a sidewalk fund, your general fund your one cent local option sales tax and whatever project TR1901 is. Well, if you did that next year, you'd have $265,000 to spend. So you're telling me you don't have any money, you're spending $165,000. It's not the $30,000 that I saw in the budget. I don't know how that works, but maybe the internal auditor can figure it out. But <laughs> it's 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 elementary. You got 165. We're trying to give you 100 more. That's 265. How can you say we're how are we ever going to match the hundred thousand dollars? You already went over it. Can can we include bike lanes for that, or is this good, is it just going to be limited to sidewalks? Yeah. If you have two hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars and and you can't pull out out of your hundred and sixty-five some money to do some bike lanes, you, maybe at the next charter meeting we'll sit down and try to help you do it. But come on, guys, you all can figure that out. It's it's it depends on what you pay for foot, how much money you want to spend for each thing. If you spend $100,000 and you spend sixty five dollars for bike lanes, you've done what you want to do. But you're going to get 200000 for sidewalks and sixty five dollars for bike lanes. <coughs> and they're only this wide, right? They're not the four or five foot wide. And they're usually alongside of a road, an existing road that hopefully will only require striping. So. It's there. You're spending it. We're trying to give you a hundred grand more. 
Vice Chair Thank you, Mayor. Um, I uh, I appreciate where the the board was going with this, and I support it. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that I think are worth mentioning. Um, if you go down to where they say uh, there's the, the strike outlines and it says the Board of Commissioners by resolution may direct the withdrawal use, blah, blah, blah. And it goes down to the third point and it says the proceeds from this fund shall not be used for sidewalks along roadways or roadway extensions, whether commercial or residential or roadways or roadway extensions are not physically in existence at the time of this adoption. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that, are, that speaks to part of our land development code in terms of if you, if you were going to uh, do the Bayshore Heights development, right? The la and, and that road, that those approvals are not there. The roads aren't there. Uh, the land development code speaks to the developer being responsible for putting, the, uh, putting them in, yeah. right? So I think that this is smart in the sense that it speaks to that. However, I would maybe add, uh, or until such time as said roadways are constructed, right? So, I mean, the way it reads is we can't, utilize these funds for sidewalks along roadways that aren't in, aren't in existence but if they're create and that says but it but then it caveats it to where it says in existence at the time of this adopt uh, the adoption of this section right so the way it reads is and correct me if I'm wrong Mr. Attorney is uh, until such time of adoption of this section right so if there's no roadway in existence today and we adopt it today but two weeks from now there's a roadway there we can't use and for some reason it was the development agreement where the per the land development code you know the developer didn't have to put the, si the sidewalks in and a roadway is constructed after this adoption it limits us in the use of the sidewalk funds is that correct yeah so um i'm not sure about the development agreement that you're referring to but it's a hypothetical okay so in this last sentence, you're basically asking if you delete this portion of it, are not physically in existence at the time of the adoption uh, of this section, then it would basically um, not allow you to put in sidewalks in areas where there isn't currently a road. No, I, I like the way it's written. I'm saying the way it's written, if it's adopted today, mm -hmm. in two weeks from now, we u utilize some development agreement or some mechanism to where somebody put in a road and didn't build the sidewalk contrary to what's required within the land development code because it was built two weeks after this was adopted now we can't utilize sidewalk funds is that's correct okay so I'm saying I like the way it's written but can we add at the end of that sentence or until such time as said roadways are constructed or something to that effect basically saying that after adoption of this, of this section, two weeks from now, if a roadway is built and there's no sidewalk constructed, being it's built, now that it's physically built, we can utilize funds for construction of sidewalks? I think that we would need to completely reword that sentence and it, you, because you're basically saying on the front end of the sentence, you cannot use the money in any situation where the road doesn't currently exist and on the back end of the sentence you're saying but if we do have a road sometime in the future that we can use it so um, no I don't think that adding that to the end of the sentence is going to put you in a better position um, well, one's it's stating whether the road's being built or not right that's the way it reads right now it right and I'm saying in two weeks from now if the road's built after adoption of this section and for some reason there's no sidewalk we can't utilize the money to build the sidewalk or can we because the roads now been built no you would not be able to use these monies for any future projects the way that they've got it currently written but you know won't we adopt this before any new roads are built I mean I, I don't know of any new roads being proposed or built in the that's next two weeks that's so my I mean point that's my point is that if you can't if you cannot use any funds for sidewalks along roadways that aren't built Right. And you adopt this today, and in two weeks from now, it built. a roadway is built, and you there's no sidewalks there. Are we restricted from utilizing funds to build sidewalks? That's exactly what this says. You cannot use this money for any future okay, roadways. Okay, so I'm saying, if given the way it's read, and we all are understand that, after this is adopted, if a roadway is built and there's no sidewalk, we can't utilize the money. So if we can amend it to include, you know, 
provided for or at such time the roadway is constructed, then we can utilize the money to build the sidewalk, then we're good. So leaving the first portion of the sentence in doesn't help you in any way. So just deleting it altogether would accomplish the task that you want to accomplish. Any future roads could be used, or this money could be used for any future roads. It, you're not saving anything, and the, and the commission is not saving anything by having the first part of the sentence in. Um, so it, I think that what you're saying is, is it, it, it needs to come out completely to do what you want it to do. Or does it need to come out completely if provided once the road's built, the funds are applicable? Because the intent of it is to say you can't use monies to build sidewalks if there's no road there in existence. Right? So at a future date, if the road is there and it's physically constructed, then you would be able to use the funds? This is to cover that situation. You cannot use it any time in the future. That's the position that the commission is you understand what I'm getting at, Mr. Chairman? I, I do. I, <laughs> my confusion right now is, is that <coughs> when, you, when somebody brings a site plan in and you negotiate, they're going to put roads in and you say, well, if you put the roads in, we'll do the sidewalks. Do you not appropriate that money in your next budget and put it aside for those sidewalks? Because what our concern was, if, you, if you're not doing that, then you're gonna wanna take the two mil and use it to put roads in. And it doesn't,